So, um, no more slides for the rest of the day. We have a whiteboard and the strength of our personalities. Um, so, actually, we've done the product stuff for the rest of the day for the most part. It's really, we want to uh, dig into a couple of topics and really get a little more dialogue and conversation because we certainly have our perspective of how we think the market is evolving. We'd love to, you know, just engage in some conversation about your perspective on that. We're going to talk about, uh, Jan's going to talk about hybrid switching. Uh, as I said earlier, he uh, led the uh, work group in ONS on the topic, so he's done a lot of thinking about it. So he's going to share some of the things they came up with uh, in terms of things you should be um, cognizant of. And I think as customers actually try and you know move from you know the, the unicorn version of SDN to the plow horse version of SDN, uh, you know there's a lot of okay, how do we get there? What are the practical issues to think about? So I think it should be a good conversation. After that, we're going to wing it a little bit. Uh, so Prashant Gandhi, who leads uh, the ONE the ONE effort from the engineering perspective from, from a product management perspective is going to be on. So there are a couple of things we can talk about to wrap up the day. We thought um, one, of the, one of the products, the products that he's, he's responsible for is a Nexus 1000V InterCloud, which is our hybrid cloud solution. So we can talk about that. Uh, we could talk about service chaining, which is something we always get a lot of questions about, our VPath technology. So we'll kind of <coughs> just kind of be agile and figure things out. Uh, but before we kick off, uh, a small piece of business. So I like to be, it's, I, I'm kind of a big fan of closing uh, loop, loops in the whole circle of life kind of thing. So 19 years ago, and this kind of hurts to say, I met Terry. <laughs> I actually sat in one of his classes on my way to getting my CCIE. So back then, I still did sub you know, I still needed pencil and paper to do subnet masks and those kinds of things. So since you were here, and it was an honor to be able to host you and be able to close that circle, I want to honor you as the first CCIE with a heartbeat. <laughs> so the first CCI number is actually the lab. So Terry was the first one to get a CCI number that <laughs> that breathes. Well, I was the first one who actually took the test. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Those are the good old days. They have to give you medal when you got your CCI back then. It's a piece of the lab. <laughs> it is a piece of the lab. <laughs> I gave it to him. It's a 2500. <laughs> ah, it looks like it's clothing. Cool. Wow. All right. Fantastic. Excellent. That's, that's actually a nice jacket. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. This is excellent. And it's not from the outlet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, and with that, I will hand you over to you. Okay. okay. So, uh, Maybe I'll start with a question. What, is it? what would you like to know about hybrid switching? Or what do people think about hybrid switching? Let's go back what to the first question. Yes. Okay. Define hybrid switching. Yeah, define what we're going to talk about from your perspective so that we know how to frame our response. I've not heard the term before. Uh, well, it can mean, as, as you pointed <coughs> out, it can mean multiple things to multiple people. So uh, maybe what we try to do is first try to frame it within the ONF um, uh, framework, which is you know, hybrid switching in context of open flow. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I was one of the co-chairs uh, of the hybrid switching working group in ONF. Um, the group has uh, concluded its work um, a few months ago. Um, the ONF board felt that the work has done, uh, the group has done whatever it needed to do and uh, doesn't need to be doing any work anymore. And uh, uh, ONF wanted to uh, pursue uh, more kind of pure open flow switches and hybrid network environments. What the group was doing was um, looking actually both at uh, hybrid networks and hybrid switch devices. It's, it's like two different things, and we can talk about it um, um, in much more greater detail uh, as, we, as, we, as we go forward. Um, but uh, the ONF board's uh, position was, well, we really want to look at pure open flow switches. We are about uh, pursuing, yes? So when you say hybrid, you mean combination of doing, pure, uh, of doing open flow and doing regular switching? running spanning tree stuff like that in one box or within one network when you say hybrid? Correct. That okay. was, that was okay. well, 
we actually never quite got to a definition of a hybrid network. Okay. <laughs> After how many years? You uh, it, it, the group was in existence for about nine months, and we always struggled with the concept of a hybrid network. What is a hybrid network? According to Nick, Nick McKeon, a hybrid network is any network which contains open flow switches. It has open flow and it has legacy quote unquote control plane, so it's a hybrid network. But you know, when you actually start thinking about it, is it really a hybrid network or, or is it not? I mean, would hybrid network, because if that's a hybrid network, then we've been ha having hybrid networks for 50 years now, right? I mean, we've got different devices and different types of devices with you know, different capabilities in a network. Now, when you look at it, what would really a hybrid network be if we took the definition of the hybrid switch, which we came up with, and that was, that was within the context of open flow, it was, it was fairly simple. Uh, it has the open flow control plane, which means a connection to an open flow controller, plus a legacy control plane, and operating on a common data plane, on a common um, uh, forwarding pipeline. That was roughly the definition of a hybrid switch, and uh, that was relatively easy to arrive at, and uh, we, we, we got pretty good consensus on that. Um, if you try to apply the same concept or the same principle to a hybrid network, you would have to have two control planes in a network. But any kind of a network that is actually in existence has only one control plane, which is pretty much IP. Even the Google network, you know, where they, which they build out of the open flow switches, it has an open flow controller, but you know, what drives the network on top of that is BGP. It's Quagga and IGP and BGP. It's basically an IP routing stack, right? So, um, you know, would a hybrid network be something that has two control planes? If it's two control planes, how would that work? You know, what would the other control plane other than IP be? These are all questions, you know, that actually just start going down the rabbit hole rather than, than, than coming up with a solution. So I think the simplest way that the board wanted to have the, the, the question answered is, well, a hybrid network is anything that has an open flow switch in the network. And uh, in the end, I, I guess that's what we agreed on. So what is happening now uh, is they are trying, the ONF is trying to put together, as you probably all know, I mean, if you're receiving the ONF reports from, from Dan, we're trying to put together a working group uh, which would be focused on hybrid networks, which would be driven by operators. Uh, by interesting choice, you know, in the hybrid working group, in the first incarnation of the hybrid working group, you know, and have most of the people who did work uh, on the, uh, in the, in the working group were representative of um, 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 hardware vendors. So we got guys from Juniper, we got guys from Marvell, from Broadcom doing really good work, a uh, couple guys from Cisco, you know, guys from BSN, so uh, vendors, uh, not operators. Uh, we did not have a single operator in the group, kind of, you know, somebody with an experience how to run an open flow network or a hybrid network. Yes? So, when you say being built of operators, I assume this, we're talking about operators that are that paid the $30,000 to be part of the NL? No, no, operators that will actually deploy open flow <laughs> in their networks. So, so, so you're saying they're looking to looking outside of the ONF to bring people in to help the uh, So, so that there is a subset of those who pay the thirty thousand and who are running open flow in a network. Google being one of them, right? I mean, they've got this this um, uh, uh, G scale network, which is open flow driven, right? It's probably the biggest open flow network in the world. Then you've got some guys like NTT who went public with having open flow in a network and pursuing. So. Um, I personally, I'm not aware of anybody else who would actually have anything. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are operators who are playing with OpenFlow and trying to deploy OpenFlow in the networks. And uh, ONF is trying to get this working group, which would be consisting primarily of out of operators, uh, um, up and running. And uh, uh, people should be exchanging experience or, you know, coming up with how a network should be. Uh, designed, an open flow network should be designed, and how a legacy quote-unquote network should be migrated onto an open flow network. 
Well, so that, and that's what I'm getting at. So that group of operators is coming out of the mining companies. Yeah, that would that what? would be it. But as I'm right. as, as I said, you know, I haven't seen this group. I mean, sure. there is there is an interesting thing going on, and from what I know, uh, you know, they're still trying to define the charter for the group. So is, is any of the work that you did with the hybrid working group, is any of that getting published or is that all <laughs> that's, that's a really good question. Uh, the board decided not to publish any of that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah well, so I'm kind of curious when we talk about a hybrid. So, so some of us can to help. To qualify the discussion, you work at an operator. Right. But, yeah, I mean... So but the hybrid group that I led on, we created yeah. like four documents, uh, terminology, <laughs> we created uh, a kind of an architect, use cases, architecture um, for, for a hybrid switch plus, plus yeah, we, we are actually describe architectures for hybrid switches. So, uh, you know, guys from Broadcom and from HP uh, gave us the blueprints and we, we, we gave examples of how, how a hybrid, hybrid switch can be, can be built. Those four documents have been delivered to the board, and from what I know up till now, they haven't been published. So uh, I mean, when, we, when we're know. talking about a hybrid, I mean, I think some of us in the room could pretty easily define them. We're, there's two pipelines. We can have some interaction between those pipelines, right? Something as simple as OFP. No, a hybrid was uh, kind of a single pipeline, and how do you have two control planes working on a single pipeline? And how do you logically divide that pipeline between the two control planes? So, but I mean, so if I have two VLAN ships in the night on one switch? Yeah, the ships in the night was one of the models that we pursued. Right. So basically, you could have either a port based separation uh, or you could have VLAN based separation, right? right? Um, so ships in the night, kind of the easiest model, the easiest to wrap your mind around, and that we proposed that was the least controversial thing. Um, and that kind of enables virtual slicing, you know, it enables to, you know, to create um, for researchers or for people who want to experiment with open flow, a separate data and control forwarding plane, you know, here is your network, do with it, whatever you want. Um, but still, you know, this did not, um, assume or presume that the underlying pipelines are actually two, uh, but there was there was a set of resources that OpenFlow could see, and so basically with the ships in a night, you've got a virtual OpenFlow switch inside of um, a, a physical switch that controls a subset of resources of that physical switch. Now, uh, you know, and we had all those discussions whether when a packet comes, whether it um, first comes into the regular control plane or whether it first comes into open flow, then what does normal mean, what does regular mean, all that stuff. And we came up with, uh, with, with definitions of that and it's all captured in those, those documents that haven't been published. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but you know, one, one part of the, of the resources on the switch have been kind of allocated to open flow and open flow could completely control that and the other part was um, for the legacy control plane, uh, legacy in terms of, uh, you know, and we actually thought a little bit more, not just layer two. I mean, for layer two, it would be a, 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 a layer two uh, forwarding switch with, you know, spanning tree and what have you. For layer three, it would be a routing control plane. So, you know, because you could have, and you know, there, there are implementations uh, out there um, of kind of hybrid devices where, you know, you can have, for example, OpenFlow build um, in a router uh, on top <coughs> of um, VPLS or a bridge instance, right? And you can kind of OpenFlow enable that. Uh, and then when you do forwarding uh, from that bridge instance onto through logical ports inside of the router, I mean, it, the layer three control plane takes over and forwarding plane takes over and then packets are then being delivered over layer three wherever, wherever they, 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 they go. Uh, well, it's solving the edge, right? So we're always yes, have that's that's core. holding the edge, and, and that's where the problem is: is classification on ingress. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, with what we have today, even with that group not doing anything or not publishing anything, we can do that today, right? So oh, we can do that can today. Yes, there's implementations packet. that do that. Right. Yes. So I can peel peel whatever I have for the initial application, drain everything into yeah. normal. So and but we need vendors to support that, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. vice versa on pipeline. And at the end of the day, that's where it comes from, right? And we touched on this this morning. Our belief is the cool new set of functionality 
and ultimately we see programmability in general kind of this horizontal function across the network. We also see the, the, the practical adoption model be incremental. So outside of what ONS does or does not do with the work that was already done, you know, you know, we, you know this is near and dear to our heart because there's a lot of our customers that are looking to get from here to there and looking for those hybrid adoption models. Say, okay, I don't want to break what I've got that's working, but there's cool new stuff and I want to be able to roll it out not in a duct tape model, but actually kind of have something that looks reasonably well engineered. And without to ripping, be able to ripping out all of our gear yeah. in order to start testing this. Well, so that requires yeah, and that absolutely. takes me back to the argument I've been having with you is that our gear is too expensive. Right? So one of the reasons that we don't want to rip out our gear is because the, the networking equipment that we buy today is costly. Everything that I buy in the network is on a five or a seven year ROI cycle. So I can't take anything out of my network to do new stuff because... Uh, uh, exactly, so that's, that's the approach that we took for example, with the 9K or you know the, the implementation in Cisco, it's really you know take a virtual instance of uh, virtual switching instance inside of a router yes. and OpenFlow enable it, and you know uh, you can have it either ships in a night. Well, this is basically ships in a night implementation. Yeah. What you can do is say this port belongs to OpenFlow and that's it. And then at yeah. port level, yeah. this one goes into the into, into right. acts like a normal rooted. And, and we actually use this in other applications. We use OpenFlow as an API to drive uh, uh, ACL programming to do exactly what you mentioned, it, which is you know peel a part of the traffic in a certain way, and then you know the rest is uh, forwarded in a in a default manner, which is one of the biggest advantages of a, of, a, of a hybrid device. So um, uh, you know you don't want to completely move on to OpenFlow, which is um, kind of a, you know, unproven technology. It's a completely different paradigm from uh, networking today. Networking is distributed by, by definition, distributed control plane. You know, we worked on it for 50, 60 years. Uh, it's a reason why it's distributed. I mean, it's been uh, for resiliency and availability. Um, you know, it's been designed, the, the first, uh, you know, the first internet has been designed to uh, survive nuclear attacks, right? So, you know, there is no single point of failure, you know, uh, the, the network is self-healing, self-adapting. And that's principles, you know, that we, that we worked on for, for, for 60 years now. And you replace that with a centralized uh, control plane where all the intelligence is, um, you know, in one place. And it may be logically distributed, but it's, it's still in one place. You know, it's it's um, uh, well, an unproven model. Put it this way. administrative domains. I don't need nuclear war fallout survivability, right? I need business logic integrated into the network. Um, yeah. So I need to be able to peel a flow off and munge it. Yes, right? absolutely. Like so I you know, to say that this said, group of ports are treated <coughs> differently from the rest of it. Right. Now, I understand what you're saying. And internally, inside, you know, if you've got a TCAM, which who's feeding entries into the TCAM, and what happens if the TCAM entries overlap, right? So if you punch an OpenFlow entry in and it overrides a span entry entry in the TK, how do you arbitrate between the Absolutely. And, and that's the pipeline discussion. Yeah. Right? So the so, table should theoretically, I mean, that, that takes right. away a lot of the race. Right? You, you know, there is, so, you know, I, I'm not arguing that centralized doesn't have a, um, a place in a network. Uh, but the kind of basic substrate, the layer three or, you know, the, the routing, when everything else fails or the centralized entity fails, I have to have something to fall back on and I'd like to have the distributed layer underneath. I can have traffic engineering optimizers or you know, demand admissions like path computation element or what have you, which has a better view of the network than what the individual routers have. If, if I want to do you know, traffic steering or traffic engineering and uh, do anything else than, than default routing, this other thing, this other intelligence can do measurements in a network and can steer the traffic around hotspots and what have you and, and kind of in real time optimize the network. Need to do, why does a networking device need to do span entry and brooding and mm -hmm. MPLS and MPLS TE and the kitchen sink, a paintbrush and a pair of rubber gloves right. and a little fluffy toy? Right? 2,000 other RFCs. Right. And to, yeah, and to, <laughs> you know, I'm not 100% sure that OpenFlow. In a, even in a hybrid network, I don't think there's that many campus networks even implementing F MPLS because MPLS is expensive to implement. You, to implement right. one MPLS feature, you require a larger TCAM because every MPLS label needs to load 
a path into the TCAM that matches that table. So right. a 3750 would suddenly go from being 55, you know, being 5,000, 700,000 unit cost to being 50,000 because the TCAM is now twice the size and right. draw twice the power. Exactly. So in a campus network, we don't need any of this stuff that operators need. So what Verizon and you know uh, Google are trying to put into their overflow implementations are irrelevant for what campus mm -hmm. needs. Which is what, and, and the, the, where that translates is you see who's actually deploying the stuff in the actual use cases. It's all the operators. If you look at adoption on the operator side mm -hmm. versus adoption in the enterprise, it's wildly different. Yeah. Because on the enterprise side, for the most part, they've invested in expensive infrastructure. They've invested in, in, in expensive uh, and you know, rich management systems. So they have a lot of that stuff. And I think, I think Ivan made this uh, analogy about taking the round wheels off a car and putting some, yeah. you know, new, slightly less round wheels on and being proud of that. And I think that's where a lot of the conversation is. I think we're getting to a pivot point where we're starting to be able to do stuff with programmability that we can't normally do with the current protocols and those kind of things. And I think that will start to get people's attention on the enterprise. And like, mm -hmm. like some custom routing, some of the stuff we talked about this morning. In the in the one PK discussion, where hey, here's stuff that we can do in a much more cost effective and a much more feasible perspective, with controllers, with protocol, with, with programmatic programmatic controls that we can't necessarily do with MPLS or whatever, yeah, but, or but, not have it look like it's all you know duct tape and bailing wire. Well, I think the flip side here is what mm -hmm. we're seeing in terms of Open vSwitch and the level of innovation that's occurring there, and we're now seeing you know different forks of Open vSwitch. Some people are taking it off to do BGP and attaching an XMPP interface on the BGP to be able to program the edge. Mm -hmm. Other people are adding extensions to OBS to do uh, rewrite functions that emulate routing functionality and then put, uh, hitting, the, hitting the flow into a tunnel, mm -hmm. right? I think as Open vSwitch gets more penetration, largely due to OpenStack, right, people are going to start challenging whether a router is actually a network device anymore. What we actually want is a packet processor. I don't want a router. I don't think within five years we'll be talking about routers or switches. I think we'll be talking about boxes that do packet processing. Well, I mean, we've had there'll be software versions of that, which is a software vSwitch, like a la Nasira, a la Open vSwitch, a la what Microsoft's doing with their NVGRE mm -hmm. hypervisor. And there'll be physical packet processors. And they just move flows according to some arbitrary rules. I don't think routers will survive you know, they won't be the only network processing device in the, in the future. Okay, the second piece I'll agree with. I mean, we've had Route D for forever, so it's not like routers are really the only things that have ever done, you know, force network, <coughs> pol in network pol in policy enforcement. I, you know, I think it comes down to where do I invest my time? And if I have a bunch of stuff that works already, what's going to get me to the next piece and how do I get there in a way that's cost effective? And I think this is where the hybrid piece right. becomes the important conversation is, okay, there's cool new stuff I want to get. I want to get. And when you have this with anything, it's a new line card, it's a new whatever. How do I get there and how do I still preserve what I just bought and I'm still paying off and not mess with the 80, 90, 97% of stuff that's up, that's running, I don't want to mess with it again and you know, reinvent the wheel. In an enterprise, you know, in the service provider environment, you have one or two types of jobs that you do a million times. In the enterprise, it's the other way around. You have like a million different types of environments well, you also that run 1% of the time. Well, the enterprise, too, you also know your system. Yeah. So in, in an enterprise, one person usually, not always, but conceptually, knows the whole thing. They can actually see down through the, you know, the backbone to the, to the WAN edge, to the LAN edge, to the access layer, and they also get visibility into the data center. There's one small team who sees the entire stack. Whereas in a service provider, operationally, they don't actually... There's probably nobody who actually understands the entire stack. Because you know, they might have a 3G and a 4G. You know, and in a 3G network you need to understand GGSNs and SGGS, you know, and SGSNs and termination of 3G PPP protocols in various points in the network. But in 4G you're running into a completely different network architecture which runs into an MPLS backbone which is using DWGM. It's not possible to be across all those domains and to be coherent in the architecture. And I think OpenFlow says we can bring all of that stuff down to a simple primitive. And, and attaching too much importance to the legacy is probably going to hold you back. Well, uh, well, well we innovate with protocols and RFCs, and then there's this domino effect to every other RFC you're already supporting, right? I mean, we've got to get to the point where you can actually deliver. I mean, NFV is no different, right? They want to deliver applications in much shorter times than, than what they I mean, in the enterprise security, look at BYOD. We've been talking about horrible BYOD strategy for years. 
not just it, I mean just in general, right? <laughs> and it's just classification as you come on the edge. But, it, but every single one of those are not portable to any other network, any other device. Uh, I mean, it's just, we need fundamental instruction sets to kind of start abstracting, get, get somewhere. Yeah, you know, I've been in uh, ONF um, <laughs> multiple working groups trying to even define like a kind of common data set for the forwarding device. Yeah. And uh, even that is proving to be something very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and um, I actually think, you know, this may be an abstraction, or, uh, actually the wrong abstraction level, too low. Because uh, if we define maybe you know, at a higher level uh, a, a, a set of operations like these forwarding operations, you know, um, that kind of are more at a policy level rather than individual flow level, that, that, that in the end may be, may be, may be a better approach. Because you know, you've got all the, the forwarding pipelines, the individual vendors want to, uh, hardware vendors want to, want to uh, innovate, right? I mean, um, Cisco wants to differentiate themselves from Juniper. Marvel wants to differentiate themselves from, from Broadcom. So, you know, how do we come to a, uh, a, a, a common set of, um, of features or, you know, operations that, that, that should be defined for, for forwarding packets? Yeah. Um, I mean, for understanding it. That's, I totally agree with the packet processing, mm -hmm. but it's just this mush of stuff that can happen it's maybe hard to wrap your brains around, brain, fit your brain around. Whereas if you um, think of it as I'm doing a layer two rewrite or a layer three rewrite or a server low down sort of rewrite, you do get into the question of sequence of operations perhaps, mm -hmm. which gets a little sticky. But maybe by partitioning it like that, that it becomes easier for it. You know, maybe I'm, maybe it's just us versus new duties to the field. So right. You know, the other thing that was kind of interesting, and it's actually interesting on all the interops, is uh, even if everybody defines the same um, uh, operation set, uh, the performance points are extremely diff different. Because some of these operations uh, in some implementations have to be defined in um, software or, you know, don't go in the ideal data path. So uh, theoretically, everybody supports everything. But you try to put it in a network, and some devices have good performance, some don't, for a particular set of applications. Yeah. So I figure we'll have like flashcards. You'll have a class one, a class two, a class three. Yes. And you know, and a class one will be a 50 flow per second switch, and then a class uh, two will right. be a, a but, 300. But flow we, per we've got to get to that to that unification. But yeah. until then, you know, we just move the work. From um, well, yeah, you know, so I've got this kind of common substrate, and you know, I got away with you know all that vendors complicated control plane, and you know, I replaced it with my my open source. But who's going to integrate this? Who's going to test this? Who's going to you know make sure that it all works? Uh, that that is that in itself is is a, an entirely new new set of problems, and you know, so we're in agreement, you know, that that things are changing and will change. But um, I was not saying you know, that, that open floor is good or bad or, or stuff like that. It's just an entirely different set of problems that need to be solved. And we don't have experience with it. Whereas we have experience with the other type of networking. So you know, doing the approach that, uh, that, um, that uh, was, was suggested, um, where you know you peel off maybe a, a, a certain percentage of the traffic, you know, get experience with uh, with with that without affecting the rest of the traffic, and you know, th that that that's that's like the sensible approach because I mean, we're gonna figure out what a, what the scaling is. We're gonna figure out what the failure scenarios are going to be. Um, the different paradigm of uh, centralized versus distributed control plane, right? I mean, things will go wrong in very different ways, right? Um, so uh, it's, um, it's, it's, going, it's, it's an interesting new world. Yeah, well, I mean, but that's sort of part of I mean, what you're basically, you know, that, that one little application, we're talking about a, an industry that hasn't necessarily evolved outside of silicon in 15 years. So yeah. that one little piece is, I mean, that's going to be a ripple effect, and that's going to be some domino. Oh, I can just forward this, and I'm tapping, and I'm taking something that used to cost me half a million dollars to do it, 10, 40, 100 gig. Now I'm doing it $5,000. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, all the more reason we need hybrid architectures, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And I would actually think, you know, that we need maybe APIs at a, at a higher level, you know, where you, these systems are not, not, not really done, not just, just kind of a couple inches about the hardware, uh, but, but have some, some software intelligence and, you know, you kind of program it at the policy level, maybe you program it at the RIV level rather than, uh, rather than having to deal with forwarding pipelines. For power users, you absolutely need to talk forwarding pipeline, mm. uh, but it's extremely difficult to unify that kind of an API. Can, can someone just define for me what you mean by pipelining? Because you're talking about two separate pipelines, right? One for, one for the normal forwarding. What, when you say that, would it... Good. A, okay, yeah, a forwarding yeah. pipeline is something, you know, when a packet comes in on an interface, uh -huh. then, uh, you know, you have to strip the header off, you know, you have to do a lookup, then you have to uh, You're apply. You're the path that a packet takes through a device. Okay. Right. <laughs> through the route, router or a switch. And uh, you've got different types of pipelines. You've got a layer two pipeline for, for switches, and you've got layer three pipeline typically for, for routers, right? And they, 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 they are different. And some of them are very simple. Uh, some of them are um, are complex, you know, um, because if you need QoS, if you need like as you mentioned, like MPLS forwarding, IPv6, or this and that, I mean, it, it just gets uh, gets very complicated very fast. What actually happens inside the chip? Order so operations. When a packet comes in on the chip interface. Yep. So normally it'll pass through a, a layer two engine processing engine on a Mac get the Ethernet header will be stripped and then pop into the system on a chip. So if you think on a 6500 blade or a 7000 blade, mm. behind that is a replication engine which decides if it's a broadcast or a multicast. If it's a multicast then it breaks the stream into two pieces and then it passes it into a, a forwarding chip. Mm -hmm. but what does that forwarding chip do? It looks up an address table to see where's the next hop. If it needs a rewrite it gets passed into a rewrite function on the silicon to rewrite the TCP header and calculate the CRC check and inject a, an MPLS tag and rewrite. Yes. Do you know all these things are all done in a, in a data pipeline through the chipset in the silicon. We don't normally think about these things in day to day because they're invisible to us. Yes. When it was switching or routing it was actually very simple. A packet comes in, it doesn't really matter where it came from, it only matters where it's going to because we only care about the destination MAC or the destination IP. Mm -hmm. Now in the OpenFlow world, we care about your source MAC, your source IP, your destination MAC, your destination IP, your source port, destination port. And then we're going to carve out a flow yeah. from that. So and how do you run that through the processing engine? See, this, this was what I was alluding to before. Most of the pipelines are kind of optimized for the existing forwarding. Like, it didn't matter where the packet comes from, just where the packet is going to. So, you know, for certain types of OpenFlow lookups, uh, when you only match on destination MAC addresses or you know, only match on you know, certain <coughs> set of fields that the hardware is good for, it can go through a hardware pipeline. As soon as you have to match, you kind of out of the realm of what the current hardware can do, you've got to pump that packet typically to a processor, processing the software and inject it back. And it's a few orders of magnitude slower performance. Yeah. Now, there is hardware coming um, on the market, you know, that, that can do a couple hundred thousand of flows um, with, you know, full match uh, capability at, 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 at full performance, but everything has its cost, you know. So if you want this, want, want this flexibility, I mean, then, then you've got to put in more hardware and it's, um, it's, it's, it's more cost. So, you know, are the <coughs> open flow switches necessarily going to be cheaper than, um, than uh, really the cheapest commodity hardware? That's yet another question. You know, but that but isn't that a good story for the vendor, though? Because I firmly believe that the, the hardware is going to stay the same. The, the consumer is going to get more capability out of it. That, that's going to stay fairly fixed unless you're hyperscale. Or should we all just move to the x86 forwarding pipelines? Right. I don't know. Um, I mean, that's, so uh, the the power is getting there, you know, yeah, for... Yeah. Uh, um, you know, certain set of applications, certain set of speeds and feeds, I mean, x86 is a perfectly good solution. You know, you've got everything in software and, you know, you can do whatever you want there. Well, don't you, I mean, at some point, though, the data center is going to continue to, to innovate because they can do this in software and they can bring applications right. to market. Exactly, in, exactly. In weeks instead of years, one of the founders. At some point, the enterprise and service provider can say, hey, where's ours? So, you know, I, I, yeah, so I mean, I, I started my career writing software, right? I, I'm always somewhat skeptical. Uh, when people tell the story, they talk as if software development is this clean, linear, <laughs> 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 you 
Cause of attack <laughs> process. Yeah. We're, and, we're and, getting into more problems with abstraction. So I, 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 I was, you know, there's always thing, you know, hardware, software velocity is always better than hardware velocity, which is true. But I think, from a, a user perspective, it's a lot messier. If you get, if you buy an ASIC from us, you know it's, sure. you know, it does what it does, but it's baked. You know it's going to do what we told you it's going to do for 99 out of 100 times. Software is a lot messy, and you know, I think one of the things is, I'm not sure how much customers, the typical end user, is prepared to handle that. I mean, if you're a, you know, a global 30 financial services company, or you're Google, you can throw dev engineers and support engineers and all this stuff at this. I think the typical Joe, Jane, mid, you know, mid-market, or even a, a decent for, Fortune 500 enterprise, you know, I think that whether you do SDN or not, I think it may not be the technology piece. It's like, okay, is this the cost-effective solution for us to go chase, or much, would I much rather buy someone else, I mean, even buy from an, from an integrator, and when it falls over at two o'clock in the morning, it's their headache, not my headache. I've been worried yeah. about this uh, very good that you get called in because somebody's having a problem, and you find out that somebody talked them into, I'm running controller X with these 30 different plugins that are all supposed to be the sexiest mm -hmm. thing alive, and you've got to somehow figure out which one of those 30 plugins has a plug. Exactly. But, but I mean, that's not exactly. new. We did, that, we did that in 1999. I was implementing OSPF routers in our and having Wellfleet and Proteon and Cisco routers, and none of them worked together, right? OSPF was a disaster area in 1999, right? It didn't work at all. Today, I can configure an OSPF <coughs> protocol, and pretty much it works out of the box, right? So but you know what are you the, wishing for? You're wishing for a decade of innovation in, in one year? No, no, that's, no. That's the, the, the OSPF protocol is relatively simple yeah. compared to what we're trying to do with applications yeah, no, no, no. running on the, the controller. Sure. OSPF yeah. protocol is Just doing one it. one thing, <laughs> one and only one, actually two things. I mean, maybe flooding packets and you know exchanging hellos, what, what have you, right? Uh, but it's it's a very limited functionality. What we're trying to do with the applications, I mean, sky is the limit, right? Mm. So we as we develop new applications, we're going to develop new ways how to screw up the network. Mm. You know, OSPF was 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 one thing, and you know, it had a certain set of ways how to screw up the network. We we worked it out. You know, don't need to touch it again. With apps, you're going to have new ways. Sorry. Yeah, I, I agree with Omar on, on what's going to transpire here. Um, we're going to see companies develop software. We're going to move to a software kind of environment because the vendors like Cisco can then iterate. It, it's a five-year cycle for new, new silicon. Okay? That's too slow now. They need to move faster, and the only way to do that is with software. So they're going to be developing the libraries, the subroutine calls, if you will. It'll be a network subroutine call. Give me a layer three network that encompasses these ports in my network that interfaces out using this protocol to the rest of my legacy network. And is it composed of, is it one subnet or is it multiple subnets? So it'll be some abstraction layer which is higher than anything I've heard anyone here say yet. Um, but I can see that that's, that's where it's eventually going to go is it's going to be, yeah. my analogy is like memory management. It used to be I used to have to do my own memory management for mapping regions of a program into memory and execute them and then map the next piece in. I had to do that manually when I first started doing software development. With virtual memory, it all happens underneath the covers, and yeah, there were bugs along the yeah, way, but it's that's, been that's what I was talking about. That we need higher-level APIs with policies, and maybe you know right. the first step that we that we've got in Cisco is the one PK. I mean, it does yeah. have a higher level uh, we're gonna have a of, of interaction with the system than than mm -hmm. just uh, just um, the, uh, the yeah. But I think point. when you're yeah, talking about one PK, you're, you're talking about foundational element, not packages yes. that they're yeah, combined yeah. with it. Uh, or my routing package and, and a package, so but, on. Right. but it moves up. I mean, if you look at the service sets we, uh, that uh, John showed you this morning, it's kind of starts to, uh, you know, it starts <coughs> the process of um, it's the foundation abstracting and logically. Grouping oh yeah, no, it's not a knock on it. I, yeah, mean, right. I, I expect, and to your point, that there will be early. You know, Cisco has a very defined second market strategy, right? You know that will see systems integrators and startups, whatnot, fill in that void. And as, frankly, the market's defined, Cisco put its weight behind it and release products that fill that gap. And we'll go from insanity to stability in the place, in that space. This whole discussion is starting to come, starting to kind of click for me, because especially when you just said, I just got the higher level API thing, which is the memory management thing. I'm sitting here thinking, hey, we're overcomplicating this, having to talk about all the guts and the details and think about you know planes and all that. It is abstracted to us right now, and I don't think we have to go back there. 
Greg probably totally disagrees with me. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I figure, and I saw the one. But, I, but I'm starting to get it. I'm not necessarily saying that's where I'm at, but from the one PK thing, one of the things that you said is the vendors are going to have to differentiate themselves. I think differentiation isn't, yep, isn't necessarily going to be that you guys aren't using the same standards because we've got to get back to some standards, core functionality, so we have interop. But I think you guys are going to differentiate yourself between what your APIs can do and what you allow your ecosystems to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's the differentiation, and I think very quickly, if the vendors don't want to piss everybody else off in the in the consumer environment, that you guys are going to have to come to a way that you can interrupt. Honestly, I mean, right. me, me and Britt were talking I, I about this earlier. I fully expect, just same in the cloud side, how you, the API used to be very, very important for cloud providers, and now things mm -hmm. like LibCloud and JCloud are emerging to abstract it from... Frankly, you don't have to be that aware if you want to use a subset of the functions. Mm -hmm. you know, I think we're going to see, see something like that happen. Everyone will argue exactly. about which spec's the best. Mm -hmm. And you know, someone will get smart and just write libraries that write to all of them. We'll end up using a subset of the functions, but still end up with an existence of, God forbid, functional networking elements that are configured stuff. <laughs> but, 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 but what plan are we living on to, for us to expect all the vendors to agree on an order? I know, they argue all day. We've got that today. We've got SNMP, right? And I've got no ID list that's from here to across the room. <laughs> Is that, is that going to so, so I think a better model. I don't think you can hold that up as a, as a good model. Okay. the models. So, so if you look at Ethernet, like it's, a, it's a defined set of interfaces. You know, you're at the point you can take any two things, even God forbid a dealing box, and an enterprise dealing box and plug it into something else and the world's a happy place. But there's still, you know, a lot of differentiation. I don't think anyone would say a dealing box is the same as a Cisco box, is the same as a Juniper box, is whatever. And I think from the vendor sense. perspective, that's, you know, where it starts to become interesting. Is, and I think there are a lot of folks who believe that network is utility and networking is just networking. And I think as they start to roll up their sleeves, they'll start to see, oh, really, there are some implementation differences. We used to joke, you know, we, you know Cisco is successful because we drop packets better than anyone else. <laughs> Which is, you know, some it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of silly, but it's kind of true, right? There was some of the implementation details that made this switch better than that switch. I, I think the other thing from our perspective, and the reason we've talked about those service sets is, if you look at, you know, we had this conversation on Twitter about licensing. If you look at all the stuff people buy from us, and then all the stuff they actually implement, it's like they buy these feature sets and they implement mm -hmm. these feature sets. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because they don't think it's, they're hard to figure out how to get to. I think from our perspective, one of the reasons we think this is all interesting is to take the, you know, a lot of the cool the stuff that's already in there that they've already paid for and make it more accessible to the people that will actually use it, which is not network operators, but developers. So to your point, you know, my goal is we get to a point where developers can say, you know what, I need a 10 meg, get, uh, 10 meg pipe that's PCI compliant, that's HD video capable, and you know, make that call through their software, and boom, it's up and running, and the rest of the infrastructure underneath is smart enough to figure it out all the way down mm -hmm. to the boxes, and you know, be smart enough for the, to be able to figure out you know, on this box versus that box, it's gonna look a little bit different. Well, look, before we go too far away from the hardware of the stack, I mean, theoretically, this is what the fog is supposed to be working through, is this defined set of abstractions at the hardware there, right? So some, some kind of hardware matrix that comes out of that, I think there's a lot of room to differentiate at the vendor side. And this is all guess because I don't know what goes on with that. I'm just assuming. That I, I, I think so too. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not following it. You know, I was following the earlier efforts um, and uh, it was very difficult to come to a, uh, a, a, a common denominator on, on, on what, mm -hmm. what actually the following abstraction should be. Right? So um, um, I don't know. I think the other it's thing that's going to, I don't know how many people in the room are aware of it, most <coughs> of the innovation around OpenFlow is happening in the software switching space. So what's been done in Open vSwitch in terms of the extensions that the different vendors and startups have done with Open vSwitch to, to explore a number of different directions for changing the forwarding model. I think once those, I get an advantage in that I actually speak to not just to you, you know, to Cisco, but I'm also being briefed by Juniper and Brocade and also a bunch of startups who aren't out of stealth yet. And all the innovation in networking is not happening in hardware because all the vendors can't agree to actually do anything in hardware because it's hard, mm -hmm. A, as we talked about pipelines mm -hmm. and silicon and pathways, it's, it's complex discussion, but also because there's a lot of jostling for position and you know, people that, you know. So we're gonna see a lot happening in Open vSwitch and I think we're gonna drive the lessons that we learn from these software switching, so what Nasira does with VMware, now that they're part of VMware and delivers in their software switch, 
what the different vendors will be doing with Open vSwitch and how they take that to Microsoft or VMware. That's going to drive don't, don't, don't what you think I, yeah, think, once, I don't think uh, I don't think the networking vendors are in control of the future anymore. I think the application hypervisors with the software switches are taking over the networking discussion. I really don't see Cisco or Juniper or Brigade leading the future of networking right now because they can't agree on an SDN strategy. But I so think there's, that that's a large, that, there's a large community of server virtualization people that is much larger than the networking community and they're just totally ignoring Cisco and Juniper and all the networks. Well, they're writing software that works on the stuff that they've got right now. It's like, listen, if we can't get anybody to agree on how to hardware forward packets, screw it. We'll just write it all in software and make it work and then take it to everybody and go, hey, I don't care if you run this on Merchant Silicon, your own custom fab stuff, or if you go buy a company to do it. This is what we're going to do with our product. Run it if you want, but everybody else is already running it. Deal with it. But there's a reason when things end up in silicon, right? I mean, we get to a point, right, that we, you know, one of the reasons software folks are in charge is because there's not a whole lot of anything that's defined or understood, right? I mean, there's no technical directions and no protocol directions. Everything's kind of up in the air. So it's really hard to spin silicon that will support the up in the air compute model. Yeah. I think as stuff starts to settle down, then we remember, hey, this is why we do stuff in silicon in the first place, because it's faster, it's more computer efficient, and we understand we need to do this, this, and this, and we need to be able to do it as fast as possible. So you guys are just trying to create more dead product lines? Absolutely, that's our plan. Yeah. That's our next <laughs> What I'm just alluding to is over time, we always start off with a functional feature set. It's, I mean, look at Cisco iOS routers t a decade ago. Everything sat in the fast path, and anything it didn't recognize was punted up to the CPU. Right. And then over time, we learned how to change to dis do distributed forwarding. You know, the, yeah. and, and we started kind of DFC. So when did the DFC1 come out? Sort of like the mid-2000s in the 6500 platform where we could actually have distributed forwarding tables on each line cut, right? That took well, a long time to develop. It. But in the early days, everything was punted through software. So eventually, all these software features that we talk about will trickle down into silicon because it's more efficient to do them in silicon than it is to do them in Well, the there, there are people who like to laugh because of Cisco Express forwarding. And it's like, oh, well, you know, that's how routers are supposed to work. Yeah, well, remember, we didn't always know how to write software to make the router work like that. We had to develop that over the course of time. Mm -hmm. So don't automatically assume that, you know, the hardware's going to be capable of doing whatever we throw at it. You know, we've got to write software to make the hardware perform you know, what we needed to do, but look at Intel and other companies who are trying to come out with, you know, what I would say is a baseline hardware platform of, that you can write to that says this is the performance profile you can get. Now, if Cisco or Brocade or anybody else who owns a fab plant wants to go in there and tweak that and say, hey, maybe we don't need as much performance out of this ASIC over here, but we want to overdrive this one over here because we really want to be able to terminate the XLAN tunnels or we want to be able to you know, quadruple the performance throughput for the Nexus, uh, the financial Nexus switch. You know, you guys can play with those variables within a certain spec knowing that the software will support it at a certain level because we finally figured out how to make those two things mesh together. Mm -hmm. Hardware and software playing in concert, but right now this is a Mexican standoff. You guys have got your guns held to the head of the software people and they've got their guns held to your head and nobody wants to flinch. Somebody's gonna have to take a chance and say, all right, I'm gonna write this, or I'm gonna create this ASIC that's gonna do this and you guys need to write software to support it. Or the software guys are gonna have to say, hey, we're gonna write this really awesome stuff and you guys have to write, create hardware to make it work. So well, I think, but I mean, part of the insanity, if you, with proactive flow instantiation right now, you can, at the edge and support, you, you can totally redo how you classify at the edge. You, you, can, you can change your, your custom forwarding model of traffic engineering, jam it into an LSP and send it on, properly classifying it with business logic, time of day, workload classification. I mean, you can go down the list right there. BYOD reactiveness in the enterprise. I mean, how hard is that? Fork me off to an isolated path instead of flipping VLANs with SMMP. I mean, it just, it's not like we're asking for a lot on this, just particular sets where we can proactively instantiate flows into it. I mean, ARPs are a little tricky. You know, that, that's exactly what hybrid switching is all about, <laughs> but that's actually the other model which, is, which we call the integrated model, uh, where you, know, you could use OpenFlow to uh, install rules into the existing control plane. Um, so, um, but that tr turns out to be a lot more tricky than, um, than, than the uh, uh, ships in a night approach.
It sounds like you've got a square peg and round hole problem. Is, you know, how do I make this new hotness work with the old busted stuff? So Just I mean, I think that we. So I mean, I'd argue at least what we're doing with giving you platform APIs is our approach mm -hmm. here. Here's un, you know un, unlocking or opening up pretty much anything you can do with a silicon. I think you got that. You got that from yeah. The, the, so from our perspective, and we talked about this a little bit. We're taking thing. We're taking features that were before hidden within the innards of the operating system and exposing them so folks, if they know what they're doing or even if they don't know what they're doing, can access them directly. So, you know, we've opened it up, we've talked a little bit about some of the applications that are being built. We'll see what happens from, you know, we'll see what happens from the software front. I, you know, I think there's a, a, a larger conversation that happen, that needs to happen, you know, within customer communities of, you know, differentiating what we can do and what we should do. Can we do our own, pla our own packet classification? Absolutely. I, I would question the number of people in the industry that really know how to write good packet classifiers and should roll them out. It would be really interesting to see, you know, <coughs> obviously we can, all, we can all argue about theoretics, so if, you know, one or two people is actually doing something. Um, but two years from now, as uh, I would assume that Cisco starts contributing, well, they are contributing a lot of code to the, you know, to functional SDN, look what Quantum's doing. Mm -hmm. As uh, I would assume Cisco starts flooding, you know, flooding the SDN market with effective util uh, code that could be utilized. How much the discussion really really shifts from when oh, you're providing me ASICs to people like, hey, I, I can reuse this code instead of making my own. Yeah, so I know mean, that you know, the, from our field is they talk to customers about one PK and all this kind of platform and controllers and stuff. You know, the, the, honestly, a lot of times reaction, okay, this is really cool, but make it do something useful for me. I'm glad I have all this. <laughs> Well, a great, great example. But you give me a toolkit. I, you know, what, you give well, me a toolkit. I really the, need a desk. The, there was a demo shown today, which actually solves uh, an, an interesting problem of how to how to force certain cloud application authentication flows through through a smart proxy. Yep. Right. I assume that code would be delivered, and we can all write. Theoretically, anyone could write that themselves with proper skills, time, and, and capabilities. But as you know, and maybe that is the war between Cisco, Juniper, whoever, is who who actually delivers working code. I think I mean, that is the war. What am I talking oh, about? Well, in the end, that, that, is, that is exactly it. But, you know, um, these applications, unless, um, well, how are you going to do that? I mean, you can go commercial, you can go open source, right? So who will be providing these, these, these applications for free and open, so, uh, open source? Well, free or pay. I don't think I really know. I, I love open source technology that links into really expensive blinky stuff. Um, I, I think it actually, it's, it's, it's really good for companies, but, you know, we'll see. Yeah, so you know, you either have software companies who you know who are creating these applications, and then somebody's got to pay for all that development, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, you've got uh, um, open flow, open source uh, uh, software, you know, where these apps are actually open source, but somebody's got to fund that too, and uh, you know, who is going to do that? And I would think you know, it's either the vendors, the hardware vendors, who want mm -hmm. you to buy the hardware, or it's it's uh, maybe the operators, you know, who want you to use the network. I remember 04, I steered a multi, I had a multi-million dollar network progress back then. The, the primary, other than the actual functionality of the network, um, once that was resolved and there were competitors that were equally functional, because I was building a 3,000 node iSCSI network because Cisco open source iSCSI initiator, mm -hmm. that actually moved my decision that way. When I think back to the dot com, I shifted from uh, Compact to Dell because of their, uh, their Linux contributions, specifically their integrations of their RAID array drivers. Remote administrate or remote the remote administration cards, and today you know as as working with OpenStack, Cisco's contributions to Quantum and the plugins that, that lock into it, as well as their contributions to Puppet deployment, drive my decisions in that direction. I think absolutely that open source contribution does drive hardware yeah. choice. And um, you will you will probably see similar things happening in the controller world. You will see that in the application world as well. Yeah. You know, so uh, kind of moving moving up the stack. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, uh, I innovation happening in the software, I mean, that's, that's um, uh, also true. And uh, well, the thing is, uh, if you really want to get performance uh, out of it, x86, I mean, it starts assembling uh, microcoding in, in, the, in the chips that are being used in hardware, you know, yeah. and to, to really get uh, 
uh, you know, performance out of out of a platform. You need to understand what that platform is. You need to understand the DMA. You need uh, uh, the uh, yeah. You need to understand the NICs, what it's using, and all that stuff. I mean, just look at Nicera's STT. I mean, <laughs> that's a really nice kind of a thing where hardware actually drives uh, uh, software software switch development, right? But um, <coughs> what I wanted to say is, with these these overlays or um, or um, kind of innovation happening in the net in um, uh, in the edge, uh, uh, true for for features and for uh, uh, kind of basic development. Um, Velocity of, of, of innovation, but you still, um, you know, the network in between is not transparent, right? I mean, um, there is um, things that happen. You know, I would just go back to what Omar said uh, about that we're dropping packets better than anybody else. When you start dropping packets, you actually need to know where and uh, how and uh, what is causing the, the, the packet drops if you, you know. Um, have a problem on this path, you know, would it be better to, to send them over that path, what have you. So, you know, um, this, this kind of a thing that we can now just uh, treat the network as a black box without, um, and, you know, everything is going to be hunky-dory and we're just going to fly over it. Um, I, I don't think, well, that's another kind of a brave new world into which we're entering and um, uh, it's, it's probably going to be different than, than you what you think. Do you think so? Well, I mean, we do that today with MPLS, right? Sort of I don't see how a VXLAN tunnel fabric is any different to an MPLS. If you have um, uh, packet losses or what have you, I mean, you've got tools to actually uh, develop that, and they are built into every device on uh, on the path. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so uh, maybe in the end, the standards are being developed or will be developed in that in that that fashion. You know, where, mm -hmm. where overlays will be able to work work uh, uh, in concert with uh, uh, with the underlying network. Well, there's extensions it's in some of the proprietary forks of OVS absolutely. that are already doing that. Absolutely. Right? But I mean, the challenge that we have with OVS today is that although there's a common code base, everybody's forking OVS. To so you, you see, what, what, what you were kind of talking, what you were saying about uh, the hardware vendors, you actually start seeing in the software as well. I mean, you've got different vendors in the software world that are jockeying for positions, and they are forking, forking, forking the code base to, um, to you know. But but that's innovation. So that's the ability to take OVS, fork it, trial a feature out, and then push it to market and see if anybody's willing to take that on. Is it a faster innovation cycle than we're used to in networking? Oh, I, I, I agree. That, yes. And that creates some of the, sort of the common misperceptions, which is, you know, oh, we don't know what, uh, we don't know. It, People have been saying to me, you know, we don't know the use cases. We can't see what we'll use OpenFlow for. Nobody can give me a use case that I can invest money in. Um, people, uh, and then on the user side, they're saying, oh, you can't use this technology because it hasn't been, you know, there's no standards or there's no RFCs or there's no, it's just because networking has been stagnant for so long, like a decade of, la of complete non-innovation, you know. So we made OSPF have not so stubby areas, woo. Yeah, and totally not so so wow, that's a total innovation there. You know, like, I mean how much innovation have we really put into the network in the last mm -hmm. decade? So as consumers and in the development side, we have to sort of accept the fact that networking can change radically, even though it hasn't in thirty years, and certainly not in the last decade, which is really what we, we need to focus on. The market sort of stagnated in two thousand and two and it's now two thousand and thirteen and this is the first you know, cycle of, of change, and there's a lot at stake because for the large vendors like you know for, for Cisco and Juniper and Bacardi, even this is either a chance to lose a position or to advance in a position in the marketplace as there's a you know an innovation gap that has to be crossed. But yeah, there's also a chance for other players to enter into networking because the software switching is can can rotate you know on a quarterly, six monthly cycle. And introduce features and, and, and change very quickly, Ch and change the face of networking. Hmm. But I, but I think there's a, there's a thing there's a pivot point there which we haven't reached yet, which is the risk of doing nothing right now yes. is relatively low. Mm -hmm. And I, I know it's good to see all this innovation forking and that kind of stuff, but to some degree that scares the hell out of people because they don't want to choose an evolutionary dead end. It's you know it's yeah. like if you look at anything like DVD versus Blu-ray or whatever, a lot of people are just going to sit in the you know they want to they're going to sit on the fence until it shakes itself out because they don't want to collect. You know, a huge collection of you know HD DVD discs because they can't play anymore. Mm -hmm. So it that's is. That's where software 
Yeah. Software so rooting and software appliances for me takes away all that risk. I don't mm -hmm. have to spend money on expensive hardware. I can deploy some software and now I can innovate over that software. We still haven't been tool support, training, all those things. You know, once you get to the point where the market looks like it's starting to coalesce, is when things will start accelerating. Right. It's, it a, to it's a typical crossing the chasm yeah. story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it is, but the thing that makes software appliances different today is where I'm actually reducing my firewall appliances and my, my software-based load balancers to functional primitives mm -hmm. to the point where I actually don't care which vendor's in there. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm using an F5 load balancer or whether I'm using a Stingray or whether I'm using a V-Shield Edge, mm -hmm. right, I'm defining the same feature set for all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm not using any of those other features because I don't want them anymore. Right. Right. Because I need to have a software controller or, or an app store or a, you know some sort of application that says make load balancer click that's what you get. And that's exactly what I was talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can do that in software. I can do that today. Right. I don't want all these fancy features that like one. My personal view on one PK is it's all very nice and very good, but it's useless. I'm never going to develop to that API <laughs> because it's got fifty thousand different pieces of function. I only need a bunch of core functionalities mm -hmm. that exist to do with forwarding from point A to point B because I don't have the time or the inclination to develop a portfolio of you know, controller applications that expend into all of those functionalities. And I, and I think, okay, so there, there are two levels here. Yeah, there's a lot of, of functionality, but that's a lower level. The functionality you're talking about with the firewall is up here. It's much higher than the functionality that 1PK is providing right now. In between is a set of libraries that take this punch the button and give me a firewall, punch the button, give me a load balancer, punch the button and give me a layer three, a level, yeah, layer three network sort of thing, relies on the low level stuff down here happening. And, okay. Um, well, also and there'll be a set of libraries that go in between the two, and so you will get what you want, but it'll take a while for that innovation to occur. It's you, not going to be have, more. Um, you, you have 50,000 APIs, but you may be using five for them for your applications. Right. And that's all that you need. But you know, the other uh, 49,995 are there for other application developers who may use them for, 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 for something else. It's no, like, I don't think they it, will. Uh, it'll, it'll I think it's like calls you. into an operating system. No, I mean, yeah, you know, I different, so. different I apps do, do different SNMP things. Were, everybody ended up just coming back to the interface 2 MIP, and that's all we ever use. Mm -hmm. Cisco's got a metric ton of SNMP proprietary MIPs. And nobody uses because it's pointless. They change all the time, they move around, you can't get a capabilities exchange, you can't roll them back, you can't write to them. And I think that for remote usage of the networking, we won't ever use all of these, you know, 4,000 RFC features. We will just end up coming back to a core mm -hmm. functional set that we actually need and can make something out of, and that's all we'll ever use. Um, the data point that I would I'd like to adduce, because I've been thinking about this issue, although maybe in a more primitive way, um, the piece I've been seeing is comparison of the distributed virtual switch with 1000V. And networking people that I'm dealing with are just totally not picking up on this is your network footprint. And meanwhile, the server people seem to be the decision makers, and to them the DV switch is overly complicated. Mm. They're not interested in 1000V, and now I'm getting crap from the VMware guy who's saying, hey, VMware's got parity. Exactly. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm with you, right? right with you. So I'm, I'm doing that now. I'm choosing vShield Edge and vCNS mm -hmm. and, v, and, and VDS because I don't need more than that. And I think that's inherent in the nature of the beast that um, to some extent we have to give up all the bells and whistles that have been competitive edge in order to get some commonality of the API and so yeah. on. Mm -hmm. and there's this debate around good enough, not in the sense of uh, crappy switches with, I won't name the vendor, but <laughs> in the sense of enough features to get mm -hmm. the job done for um, So, so basically what you're arguing for is a, a smaller set of APIs yeah. that would be kind of mm -hmm. more generic and, 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 and useful. Yeah, and so, I, I think so there'll what, be a fundamental what you're trying set. to do is embrace the innovations mm -hmm. of 30 years of product development mm -hmm. yeah. and give me those. I, I think what you'll see is you'll have a fundamental set that will have longevity yeah. because they get, actually get used by the majority of people. The other yeah. ones will start falling off because the developers won't want to maintain them. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants them, right? Because <laughs> they, they're not used. At the end of the day, there's a firewall. Like, if I pick a Juniper or a Checkpoint or a Cisco firewall, but how many people here have ever configured anything but a layer for, you know, source destination, 
with a TCP destination port in mm -hmm. their firewall other than that, ever. Mm -hmm. I've seen entire firewalls that, you know, mission critical businesses, and there's all these features in there to do, application inspection, DNS security, and nobody even knows that they exist. We don't need firewalls with all those features. We don't need um, routers that do fancy routing and OSPF to BGP redistribution and, you know, packet replication in silicon. We just need switches that do very simple path forwarding. I think that was the innovation behind OpenFlow, was that we could reduce networking to something that's reasonably primitive so that we could actually make something out of this. And then we can continue to innovate in the years to come. Yeah, we but don't have to in embrace the entire legacy of maybe, 20 years ahead. But to some degree, you're moving stuff around. So you're having very low level primitives. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do complex things, you're moving that up to the stack. So you're saying, I'll take a, a bunch of simple tools. I'll take, you know, I'll get like five different Legos, and I can build anything. And you, that's true. I think at some point you start to build more and more complicated things. You're going to want, you're going to start to want more sophisticated tools. Right, I started golfing. I had like three clubs. That's all I needed because I could barely use those. At some point, you know, I start adding clubs because I start to see, see a use for that. Yeah. From our perspective, it's not we came up with one PK and all these interfaces because we're, you know, we have a love interfaces. It's the stuff that we need anyway to go build an operating system. To yeah. think, what the heck, we'll turn it over to folks and they'll right. find things to do. We're not saying, hey, if you want to build something, you have to link to these 18 libraries to be able to build an application. You just want to build the yeah. security so, set. So, Omar, build a security set. are you saying that a, as a company that actually builds network applications, mm -hmm. that Cisco having experience building software applications, building network applications actually uses the libraries to build applications? that other people, when they start building network applications like Cisco, may actually want to build, use the same interfaces that Cisco does building iOS. Well, isn't that the point Big of 1DK? Is, this, is the same, this is the same solution set. It's the, it's the application, it's the interfaces that are built into the OS. That doesn't mean you have to use all of them every time you want to do... Well, no, no, no. So I'm actually agreeing with you is the okay. point. So, you know, <laughs> Cisco makes complex networking stuff, they and they use all this stuff, and they're exposing all the stuff that they use. And if you want to build something as cool as the Cisco stuff or the Juniper, well, whoever, that you probably want access to the same so APIs. Two I, would, I, would, I think there's two approaches here. One is the approach that Cisco and OnePK have taken, which is to say, we've got all these funky features, you know, COS and MPLS and you know, all, of, all of the OnePK map. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give you all of that and you can do everything. And I think most people are going to look at that and go, I don't even know where to start. Walk away. Most people and look at, a, at, at a, most people look at a router and say, "I don't know where I don't know where to start." Okay, but <laughs> the flip side of this would be for for the vendors to say, "I'm going to build an open flow switch. It's going to be reasonably cheap to acquire because it doesn't need all of this stuff. It can be a very simple cut down, and then start to innovate on that and save the cut and set the expectations with customers to start rotating that hardware out every two years." Well, and luckily, nothing is stopping that from occurring yet. It hasn't occurred yet. It has. There are switch vendors out there who brew it, like Pika 8. Pika 8 Pika is great. They're, you know, if you look at JR Rivers and the cloud scaling guys yeah. and what they're doing in that space, and you can go look at some mega data centers down the road and see some very specialized companies that use it, but go walk into the healthcare clinic down the road and, and go, go look for the PK8 operating system on, on Quantum no, from here. No, it's not there. But we're expecting, I mean, th this is, we're, we're really legitimately maybe a year into talking about this seriously <laughs> exactly. and probably like three months talking about this seriously because last year this time it was, we were crazy and stupid. <laughs> 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 we were stupid <laughs> academics or whatever. But I mean, we're going to keep revisiting this conversation for the next 10 years absolutely. unless oh, absolutely. unless at some point we say, okay, we're going to standardize CS 101. We're going to, we're going to agree here and we're going to create abstraction layers because there's so many more important problems that we should be solving. I don't think anyone's layer. disagreeing that. Uh, that we, that's we, the we, risk we, versus we, CISC debate, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, we went to a risk architecture and then in the end actually CISC uh, uh, kind of won out. Uh, but incorporated all the risk principles with it. Right. So, you know. Um, so so it's, 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 such, it's not a gamble when some of us that believe in this, because yeah. we've got and 20 it's years zero of computing here, that's so. already gone this path. I mean, mm -hmm. people freaked out when we started virtualizing on the server. Absolutely. We're all going to lose our jobs. Well, no, no yeah. you're not. No, but I mean, you're just not going to swap us. I, I just wonder why Cisco hasn't shipped a switch in the OF in the simplest cut down as version, supporting OF 1.3. Or 1.0. Or 1.0, and just say, Try that. I have, a, I have a question around that because Omar, earlier you said that everything in the life cycle of CAT and Nexus is going to support OpenPK. And from what we said earlier, or sorry, 1PK, mm -hmm. 
And everybody said earlier that one PK has open flow yeah, one okay. whatever in it, right? So we, have, yeah, so we have the ability to turn up open flow agents on switches, right? So the way one PK is built is you have a pluggable architecture so we can add interfaces into it. So one PK, other protocols as they come about, so they, what, they plug into it. So what I take away from that is you, is you go back through and you enable this through the, the 3850 and whatever else, these are now open flow enabled switches. Yeah, you can, and with the things we talked about, we talked a little bit about this with our current announcement, with the announcement we just made, it was starting to roll out open flow enabled switches. We had a open flow enabled 6500 on the show floor at uh, Cisco Live in London. Yeah, but I think that the, what they're getting at is what Greg and, and Brent want to say is that they don't want Cisco to open flow enable existing switches and retrofit them. They want Cisco to release just bare bones hardware. Like, if you're going to build a pickup truck, you don't take a chainsaw to a school bus. Build a pickup truck. <laughs> the, the, we don't have to want to cut away all that other stuff that Cisco's put on top of switches for years and years and years to get to a packet forwarding engine that accepts instructions from an open flow controller. I'm sure like early on, this, yes. just to try to think about this, because I'm sort of agreeing with, I, I think you might, there may be some violent agreement going on here. <laughs> <laughs> We're all right here. We're, We're all, all right here. Right. 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 And they could have bought a $20,000 box because all they're doing is destination NAT. They're not using any of the HTML read exactly. functionality. And so that, to some extent, says maybe it, maybe the missing piece here is marketing and persuading. <laughs> well, wait, the missing piece is marketing? <laughs> yeah, well, persuading people that they need to spend yeah. money for all this extra value that they're not I mean, actually going to use. Well, as you say, I mean, you know, in the vCloud 5.1, the vCNS tool set now includes a load balancer, a very competent layer 4 load balancer. Right? So now, it, and there are all these people at the low end that I've never heard of, but more and more companies jumping in, and yes. why, why would you buy one from them? Okay, so the flip side of this is that that automatically starts to make a bigger load balancing market, because VMware is giving a simple load balancer. So one of the things that Gigamon's done, so we talked this morning about the, the, the span and the 1PK being used to do port, uh, port analysis, and you know, creating fabrics of port analysis stuff. That's actually made the market for products like Gigamon bigger, not smaller. You might think that it actually took away their core business because now you can just use standard switches. But as long as they stay ahead of the curve and offer the fancy features on top, and then customers can start off with that, building these span fabrics that we've never had before, and then suddenly say, actually, I need more than this, and I need to go and buy this custom kit. I think the same thing happens with OpenFlow. We will start with simple OpenFlow enabled primitives that we can do basic stuff. And then there'll be a group of people who will say, this isn't doing everything that I need. I need to come up to the next level of feature set. And that will be more of what we have today, which is these 20 years of libraries but, and functions that nobody uses. So I'm not sure I agree with that. So I mean, yeah. Yeah. We've, we've talked about the fact that we have a bunch of customers that have stuff that's up and running. They want to be able to do open flowy stuff, SDN -y stuff. But they don't want us to have to rip up, rip out what they have that's already running. To, See, I think to that's be able a fallacy. That. I understand that that's what they think they want, but I think when they try and get down to it, I think they'll fail. Well, we will see. Our strategy is to enable customers to be able to look at uh, SDN as an incremental adoption model. They can use it where they want to, and they don't have to use it where they don't. For the most part, I think most of our customers have stuff, it's up, it's running, it gives them the features they're looking for. So it's certainly in the enterprise. Education, service provider, different conversation we have with them, they're in a completely different space with adoption and maturity and the use case and those kinds of things. Uh, so for what our customers ask for, hey, I've got all this stuff, I'd love to be able to do one, you know, I'd love to be able to have program programmatic control, I'd love to be able to have open flow access to this and try out a couple applications, a couple of workloads. That's what we're delivering. You know, if we look at where the market goes down the road, you know, we'll see. There's a pricing market as those who want zero dollar uh, products to those who want best of breed products, right? I mean, we all do that, we all buy products. Our customers buy products the same way. Uh, there is already a market today uh, for very low, uh, low price switches from Dell and Netgear and, and, and Quanta. Customers put them in their network and you know, they're happy with it, they're happy with it. Why is SDN changing that model? You are getting a cheap switch anyway today. How is how is it different from uh, with OpenFlow? 
you have the customer relationship, and you're losing customer relationships if you don't. I, I don't. I, that's not true. I mean, okay. I talk, I've talked to it's nearly really 300 good. customers, it's right? Yeah. Yeah. And I've talked to 300 customers in the last six months. Yeah. That's not true. No, you've taught them over 20 years that they should only buy expensive. That doesn't matter. I mean, at the end of they the day, they don't even know how to buy cheap stuff. At the so end of the day, customers. Break, but when they make the break, they don't want anything see, else. See, customers don't, don't look at it in black, black and white fashion. <laughs> they look at what is it going to cost me. First of all, I have to run a production network. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I have to worry about talent, right? Third, I have to worry about silos, people and processes, infosec policies, mm -hmm. operational details, right? Mm -hmm. All of these things they have to worry about. Okay. And, and, and so, so when they put all of that into, together, as soon as you get into a cloud environment, all that breaks down. That's all yesterday's. You're, that's what customers are telling in you. In fact, because they're still organised like old style businesses. In fact, OpenFlow purists are saying that OpenFlow may not be right for data center. I mean, you know, I mean, one one day you say this is going to commoditize switching. Next day you say, hey, this may not be right. Third day you say, hey, it's not going to be meeting all the use cases. I mean, you look at the the progression of where they're talking. So wait, when did this, did this all happen in the past three months? These yeah. are some conversations. Yes. Missed, right? I mean, Churchill Club. So you're talking right? to a room of that's, consumers. That talks exactly though to the point about find something that does more than you need. Because if you do get the stripped down bare bones, talks over the phone, one of those chassis that does nothing else, and then you decide that that's actually the flow is not what you want. That one. You're in control. You're stupid. You're stupid. Uh, so what? Uh, hang on, hang on. So what? So what? Well, if it only cost you five grand, or if it, if it didn't cost, it cost you, it cost you ten times more to deploy that switch, operate that switch, manage that switch, and, and, and do that. It's too costly to rip and replace. But that is not. That's not really Today, all I need is a switch agent that's going to expose that I'm going to be able to do proactive matching in. That doesn't cost me a dime. So this this idea of ripping and replacing is crazy. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I've got tools to peel traffic off. It'll work. It's like, you know, it'll work for a couple of use cases. I get excited, I deploy it. Now I have to do 10 more use cases. It's not going to work. It's not working. Now, now I'm in trouble, right? So now we, so, so we innovate via protocols through the ITF and there, IEEE and yeah, the no other single two protocol. Oh, you missed the early There is no this. single protocol in the last 30 years of, of networking that I've known that has met customers' use cases. Customers need switches that are multi-protocol. Right. And why like, is that? Flexibility, mm -hmm. right? Flexibility. So when we start talking about cases, well, what is switching? Flow forwarding fundamentally mm -hmm. starts integrating application so awareness, awareness, right? You, but you show are, me application awareness at layer two. Show me application awareness at layer three. Show me application at layer four. Combine all those things together. Give me a protocol that I can and, do that with. But you know, ripping and replacing a switch is trivial today, right? I'm puppeting most of mine. So for me to pull a switch and put a new one in, I just put a new puppet in. It takes 15 minutes. Not a big deal. I, I, I'm not sure that, that uh, and there are customers who will do that. Yeah. I, I'm not saying there is a spectrum for those who want the products for free, open source, <clears throat> right, to people who are ready to pay best of breed. But if, and, if, and, you know, we will serve a, a set of markets where we think it is the, the I mean, I'm you know, not sure the best of breed involves a dump truck full of crap. <laughs> best of breed might be a Ferrari that roars down the highway because the engine is stripped down and it's bloody uncomfortable. I mean, I mean, I'm happy to have a, 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 a difference well, of opinion, about, right? I mean, yeah. you see, right now, OpenFlow is a fantasy you cannot you cannot counter because it'll it's promising everything, it, and and there's nothing in production, right? So that's a challenge. Once it goes into production, once these things hit, hit rubber meets the road, we will see what works. It, it shows. And if it's the promising next best thing to, uh, you know, since lights bled, Cisco will have to adopt that. I mean, it's not that we are not adopting it. We are adopting it, but we are doing it in a hybrid manner, mm -hmm. which is what you don't like. You want a clean slate, right? No, it's no. not a model that we are, we are going after right That's now. That's right. Yeah. So I have, yeah, a, I have a question. <coughs> you just said that OpenFlow is a fantasy, and I'm coming at this totally dumb. I'm not trying to bait you. Is 1PK in production anywhere? 1PK is in POC. We have not released an FCS platform or GA platform today. Okay. So is, it it in production, is, is it in free production at a client anywhere? It is in proof of concept. Okay. It's as much of same, thing with open open so same thing with OpenFlow today. Yeah, so again, I, I, want, I wasn't I trying, to, I wasn't I trying to bait you. <laughs> no, so, yeah, this, this, is an, this is a discussion about a new field <coughs> right. we're in. Okay. So for any vendor to attack an open standard or another vendor's platform, quite honestly, makes you look very obtuse. No, let me, let me answer that, right? So I think your, your point is uh, spot on. So what is 1PK? Uh, we, we should understand what 1PK is. 1PK is I have my existing switch or router. I'm making it programmable. That's all I'm doing. 
I'm not changing the architectural paradigm of slicing a networking element into two halves, a data plane and a control plane. Which I think is really good for dedicated Cisco clients. I think what has been laid out for us today, if you are a Cisco shop, is beautiful because it goes all the way down through the existing Cisco stack of what's still supported, and then goes into the future. But, I, but, but there's, a new, on, there's a new paradigm coming in networking oh, that this doesn't address. Hold on though, let's go back to your, your earlier premise. You talked about proof of concept, 1PK versus OpenFlow. And my argument is OpenFlow is a new protocol, right? We don't know what security implications are, what survivability implications are, what scalability that's implications fun. are. That's fun. Right? All of, that is all of those. Fun. It's that's not. Fun. It's that's not. just no, it's that not. There's, fun. there's man in the middle attack. Hold on, wait, wait right? let's so, replace this with LISP. Uh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the scalability of the security implications of this. Come on, let's be real here. No, no, it's a new protocol. I, I, any new protocol will go to maturation cycle. Right, we we have to accept that. We have seen this with OSI. Well, no, some of those things. Some of those things you can quantify specifically, though. The protocol is right out there in the open. You know what it is. You know how the controller and the switches talk to one another. You you can see all those things. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say we don't know it's a new protocol. Well, there it is. The spec you can read it. We know it's. But that's true for every sure. protocol that's submitted in ITF. All I wanted to differentiate here is, and we can debate whether or not it meets all the security requirements or not, or whether or not it creates new new attack surface, right? I don't know, but if you think that you have, you have the answers, that's great. So no but going back to oh, one PK and OpenFlow, that's where, that's where OpenFlow is a new protocol. One PK is not a new protocol. Okay, cool. So let's simply, let's simply an API. Right? I'm, not, I'm, not argue, I'm not arguing your point. I just, again, I'm not a VAR, I'm a client. I, I, want, to, I want to keep this conversation very honest. Yeah. So but, when we say, and so I, I hope you, you would, uh, so you would be okay a with, a, with, a, with, a, with a healthy debate, right? So uh, let me talk a second. Yeah. So one PK opens up the developer package that Cisco uses to crack iOS and Nexus and everything else and add new features and manipulate things. You guys never break things and introduce bugs and security problems in your platform. You've never done it. So two on top of that, if you're now giving me that stuff, odds are I'll never do it. That being facetious. We don't know what the attack surface is what the scalability surface is or anything else around a single 1PK platform product because it hasn't been done yet. And arguably, somebody said earlier at the water cooler, coders don't do it right. I think it was Ethan, and I'm sure I'm misphrasing it, but coders don't code in perfect you know, zeros and ones and in right order. Somebody's gonna make bad code. So to go down this path and say that 1PK is bulletproof <coughs> now, you are setting yourself up to catch a bullet. I think you should be very, very careful with that. Everything you said applies to open flow as well. Open flow I'm not arguing that, but you just you, you so can't I, I, you can't take a holier than thou. No, approach but to what it. I'm saying is there is an extra caution that you need to take because you are looking at a new architecture. You are decoupling the control plane from the data plane. You're, this is not you're something hand, that you are handing one PK to people who have never developed Cisco iOS. Yeah, we've had a decoupled control plane for 20 years. Look at it. I'm right here. <laughs> Who do you think has been designing the networks as a control? So, so, okay, let's get things back on track for a bit. So, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I throw one, just one okay, thing? So, I, I think, I think where we need to get to, forget the mechanism. I, I think that's the, the least interesting part of it. I think the reason we're here is, but talking about this is because it has opportunity to possibly do it. It's probably not going to be here in ten years, but I think it's enough to get the. We need to get to the point where we've got, where we can run programs against some function that has entire topology across a heterogeneous network environment. Like we, if we can't say, here's the topology of your entire framework, your entire network, including elements that aren't even necessarily network, I, I think we're missing. But, we, but we've got to kind of level, lift that topology up and say, here's what we're going to run against. I mean, that's where I think we'll get innovation as opposed to... Sure, so I mean the... We can't go to the foundry every time we want to innovate. So I think we can all agree on some of the endpoints around programmability, that being one particular use case that folks are looking for. Um, I think we can agree that there are a couple of different mechanisms to get there. I, I think the flaws or challenges for both of them, whether it's 1PK as a new set of capabilities that people have to get used to, or 1PK or OpenFlow or LISP as new protocols that aren't necessarily fully understood, 
I think we can agree. I was bringing up a list as just I mean, to, as a, a point fair, to an it's argument. It's I think it's awesome. It's, it's a fair analysis. No, it's a new protocol. I mean, you know, it'll go through. No, I was just trying to shut uh, you down. It's fine. Then, honestly. We should, we should apply the same principles, right? It, it, it's not that open floor is a. Is okay, a, so. I'm talking shit. We're not going to win that one. We're not going to win that one. The so. open floor attack service is 1 20th the attack service of 1 Okay. <laughs> we gotta shut Greg down. Yeah. 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 We just yeah. 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 Well, let's, let's check in our if testosterone this, and check out our if brains. If we do this, I can get the trip. Cupcakes back in, we can just throw food at each other. This is the war. I think the, I, I think the challenge. No, not giving them weapons. So. <laughs> That's not helpful. We were already here. You know, I, I, so I think the point where we can have a healthy debate is the rate at which we can adopt. Right. So I think. The it's scary and we shouldn't do it is one end, which is probably isn't all that realistic. The it's ready for prime time, you should move your everything over to open flow and whatever you can, you know, get through um, BitTorrent is all probably also not realistic. Somewhere in the middle is where we are. And somewhere, I, I think the answer is different for different people. I think for the most vast majority of customers that we talk to, you know, they're very concerned about adoption. They think this is really cool. But they also want to be able to move in a progressive way where if it does fall back, and this is kind of one of the things John talked about, you have a safety net. You know, at the end of the day, from our perspective, we think the value is you can go, go hog wild with one, the one PK, the open flow agent, you can go hog wild with one with open flow, but if crap falls apart, you know, you have the existing environment that you can always run with. Right, and you can, adopt, you can adopt in a way, that, at a pace that makes sense for you. But that's really here today, right? I mean. Uh, you don't that's act like you don't know this. You can fail open, and I, I absolutely want to fail back to existing protocols. And right? we're not saying that's never, it's never going to, I mean, it's, it's like the conversation about physical versus today. virtual versus cloud, right? For a given customer, their mix of workloads of protocol and L3 are in constant motion depending on risk level and evolution of technology, those kinds of things. It's going to be the same kind of thing. Maybe it's 95% on a classic mm -hmm. control plane, 5% on a programmable control plane today. A year from now, or a month from now, depending on the tools, the developers, the industry expertise, the maturation of the protocols, technology, yeah, 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 it could be completely inverted. Two years from now, ten years from now, somewhere, right? I, I think <coughs> that's you know that's our perspective in terms of why we haven't shipped a, a new switch that's a pure open flow switch because that's not that's not what customers are looking for. They're saying there's this crap I already bought. I want it to run. It's you know make me able to do what I have, what I want to be able to do. With the stuff I've already paid for. I have two points. One was that my thought example of the F5 was people were really good at ignoring the parts they're not interested in. Mm -hmm. So I think we could turn Greg. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he gets away with it. The second, <laughs> the second, the second his wife tells me that we actually can. <laughs> the, the second one was for some reason I'm thinking Q fabric when you're talking about Ooh. fallback plan. <laughs> that hurts. So, that was just <laughs> mean. <laughs> so, but I, I, so, I think at the end of the day, if you buy a bunch of the next Nexus mm -hmm. switches, right, and you have all good intentions of open flow in the world, at the end of the day, you know, if that complete falls apart, you have a set of baked in functionality that works, you're covered. You tell your boss, you tell your lines of business, yeah, whatever you need to do, you've got a working network. If you can get the others, you know, as you get more comfortable and build up expertise and be able to take advantage of whether it's one PK or open floor or whatever, there's a transition point, there's a migration point. I, I think the thing most customers are looking for is to have some control. Well, but that's my point that. about yeah. I'm not trying to slam Juniper, it's just I see it as having a real challenge on the sales front, mm -hmm. as in if I don't like this or if it's got a nasty bug, yeah. what do I do? I, I still think it could. I want to say something, I think, since Brent asked me, I think the open flow, um, I think the hardware, as uh, Martin Casale even said, right? Um, hardware, the number of uh, entries you have at uh, Trident product, uh, the Broadcom ASICs and things, are very small, right? It's a sound 50 entries, full match, and 1500 entries, L2 only. Um, if you look at it, that's not even a rack of servers, if you put it in the ASM. So, um, y can you build interesting applications, like maybe like a matrix application or a big tap from Big Switch, for example? Yeah, you can, but I think, um, you know, I don't think that the, so forget about the protocol being mature or the controller being mature and all that. It's a, it's a second, secondary order of business. 
The first order of business is the hardware it does not scale enough today to even to do anything interesting. No. Well, you can do some things. I'm, I'm not saying you can't do anything, but you do something. Distributed on the edge, you really you can start. Doing with, the, with, the, with the virtual networking you're saying, right? I mean, that. No, I mean, I'm saying hardware on the edge. Mm -hmm. you know, I've got 2,000 switches. Right? Right. So I can do a lot, that's a lot of entries, and, you know. Well, I think, I think, the, that that. Sir, the aggregation is a problem, sure. but I don't really need an aggregation today. I need to throw it in an LSP or whatever else. Sure. Aggregation's occurring in the hypervisor anyway. Uh, so for me, I'm, I mean, the whole access level, the more I'm considering where I'll be in, in virtualized networking or in, in cloud-style networking in the data center, and I think this will also happen in the service provider, is I won't do networking in hardware, I'll do it in software. Mm -hmm. So I think Open vSwitch heralds the way. So service providers are looking at NFV, Network Functions Virtualization. Mm -hmm. They want to munge in software, not in hardware, mm -hmm. because they need to be able to change that. So if there is buggy code, or if there is something that isn't working the way it is, I don't have to re-spin my hardware platform, I just pop it up to an Intel server and run the software. That's more likely the way, and I think the innovation around OpenFlow is going to happen in edge switches, in software, in hypervisors, because the networking industry, and I think the more I talk about this, the more I'm convinced this is, the longer we stand in denial that networking can't, you know, we have to have 6,000 RFCs of features in silicon, then the less we're actually going to meet the requirement, which is just to support a, a, a less functions. We don't need all of the stuff that we do. Yeah. And I hate to say it, and I actually agree with Greg here, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, so, so like if you look at uh, like the quantum design sessions, right? People yeah. are, are doing software defined. You know, it's mm -hmm. not open flow at, at all times, but it's all about service insertions into networking topologies, right? And, and that's where the, all the development's going. And those same service insertions and the same ability to, to insert service con service controls or security controls, load balancing, acceleration, whatnot. You know, we do want these on our physical networks, and I do agree with you. The, the point of you know a service provider inserting value-added services they can pay for yeah. in, in a cheap and efficient way. You look um, at the thirty-nine forty-five we saw earlier today. But if you put a forty-eight port ten gig switch in that, yeah. and then that up, and one of those above it, and then ran a hypervisor, and you just punt everything for a cache, video content, yeah. media server, local authentication, antivirus scanning engine, what have you achieved? You've just given yourself a broadband platform, world class. Well, it, it, but I, mean, I think what I mean is what I expect to see. We can argue about how it's going to happen. You know, there are services which are being developed to to integrate into these V switch virtual switching layer, whether that's virtually accessible in hard in a hardware platform or a software platform. But these services are are software you want to buy and want to use, right? And we can argue all day long about which API they connect into. But the reality is they're connecting in there. And eventually, and most most everyone's probably not going to be writing that software. And I'm guessing Cisco will be selling some of that software in Juniper and HP and 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 and. Yeah. Right. And, well, but I think the fundamental differentiation there is open source versus standards. So I mean, you guys are in a you've got an opportunity to stay ahead of it, and if you don't, I think the quantum like fabrics are going to. I'm just. I mean, I'm not structures. sitting in Microsoft or the One KB teams design meetings, but I'm there in the quantum design meetings, right? This yeah, is my I own mean, experience. Totally. I mean, I'm sure it's happening on the four pay stuff. That's, that's, you know, it's all so, under so we had a really good conversation yesterday on packet pushers. We, I'm not going to give that whole thing up because I want people to listen to that. But <laughs> one of the things that came out of that, and again, I, it comes down to what your use case is, what you're going to need. People who are pure Cisco ecosystem, people doing the standard enterprise are going to do fine on one PK and the, the structure you build out. Greg's use case is totally different. Brent's use case is totally different. My use case is totally different. What we're going to do is we're going to find our way to the use case that serves us. I'm going to find the products that do mine. That, and that's, for me, that's going to be a mishmash of vendor X, Y, and Z, making them work off of standards and then a couple specialized pieces of hardware. Greg's probably going to go all open standards if you haven't caught on to that yet. And Brent's figuring it out. I don't, well, care. I don't get caught up on open standards. I just get caught up on... I'm not, I'm not bothered whether it's ITF or IEEE or open source. But it's what, <coughs> meets, it's what meets your need. It, yeah, as long as there's enough people running behind it, that's all I care about. And everybody can use it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not caught up about open standards or RFCs. That's or, right. it, just so long as there's enough momentum behind it, that's all I want. Well, Josh, I mean, you say, you say service provider enterprise data center. So I think what's really interesting there is... A actually, I didn't. I said my use case. Right, right, right. Sorry. I, did, I didn't break it down into well, okay. an individual model or tier. 
because my use case as an emerging service provider is going to be dramatically different than what Verizon's use case is as right, a service provider. Right, but I think the commonality across the board on all this, if you abstract it a little bit, forget about what the forwarding elements are, it's all the class, it's the edge is the problem. OpenFlow doesn't necessarily solve core. OpenFlow solves, starts giving you more more options to do things on the edge at ingress. So I think well, one other point is I think the OpenFlow, even, you know, even, even the people who, who developed it say, right, it's an x86 instruction in the sense that it, it is specifically telling a device to do back, take a packet from here and forward it here. That's but you still have to build an intelligence around it. Uh, it is it is the things that we built it through distributed protocols before. Now you have this very primitive uh, thing to do to move it. You still have to build an actual feature or usability uh, function around it. It's not by itself is going to solve the world's hunger. Right. Um, somebody has to come. And <laughs> some, somebody has to build. I mean, nobody is selling open flow. But that, you know, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> but, is it, but isn't that where vendors can make a lot of money on? I mean, that's, Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Right. No one's saying. I mean, maybe. I mean, at the end of the day, intelligence needs to live somewhere, whether it's between Greg's ears, in the silicon, in an application somewhere. It's not disappearing. We're not. You know, just because we have open flow does not mean that magically all this other stuff happens. Different customers are going to pick different solutions. Some will want to go with the open flow right, right in an application. Some are, going to, some are going to want to make it someone else's problem. Some are going to hire Greg. I, you know, I think that the, from our perspective, we're trying to give you the most flexible approach. If you want to do the open flow thing, have at it. If you want someone else to hold your hand, we'll give you that. If you don't want to do anything ever different. Many customers want to build an architecture that meets many use cases. Actually, right, and they want that flexibility. I think they, they think they want that, but I don't think they actually... Whether they think or not, they're making procuring decisions based on that. Yes. Right? Yes. Now, one can educate that and say that, hey, you so don't I, need all this. So I think that's fine, but they're making those decisions. Sure. So I think the thing that's changed in that whole conversation is, I usually use a Hadoop example, right? So if you were three or four years ago, specking a network app for your data center, Hadoop probably was not anywhere on your radar. But suddenly you're trying to figure out how to take big data and reverse engineer it into your environment. And I think that's the dynamic that's changed is the pace of application evolution has gotten way faster. So you used to be able to say, hey, I bought a switch, I bought a router, it's in for three years, I don't have to worry about my data center infrastructure anymore. And you can't get away from that, which is why we're having these types of conversations where between virtualization and BYOD and all this other stuff, we're losing control of you know, the types of traffic, where it's going, who's, get, you know, who's, who's originating it, where it's ending up. So you know, that ends up being the driver that's forcing all this kind of conversation, why do I need programmability? Why do I need this agility? It's from those sorts of things. You know, two years from now, we'll be worried about something else that you know, we can't conceive. For different folks, it's going to look different ways. I mean, instead of open flow, what is the thought process on open stack? I heard quantum. So he's, I he's, mean, he's, uh, what, <laughs> he's Mr. Isn't that, he's Mr. Open. isn't that really where most customers focus is that make it simple for me? I mean, you know, automate this. Make. Most of the focus in quantum right now is in service insertion and plugins to, to multiple different switches, OVS included. Um, so this is quantum networking plugins and MVP, uh, but most of the focus is in service insertion, right? As well as in, as well as dealing with frankly basic problems like you know IPv6 DHCP, making certain uh, important services scalable, uh, putting putting network metadata inside of you know, inside of Milan, so you know, it, it's it's a it's frankly a, a complete rewrite for Nova Network. Now, is the mechanisms for a vSwitch distribution of MAC addresses the focus on it? No, it's at a higher level challenge. I mean, it's still a data center specific use case, right? I mean, you know, he's he's talking about a lot of use cases that are beyond data centers. Yeah, but I think conceptually the model is okay. I've got a programmable stack. Mm -hmm. So even from our other competition, I'm out I'm out of the business of necessarily twiddling. No, it's about software. it's about defining and it's about defining and applying policy. Holy, holy crap! You know, this is nothing new in networking. Yeah. But it's it, just it, how you're but doing. But at a big level, you know, I mean, you start, start, start shifting thinking. We're not talking at an infrastructure stack well, level. Well, and exposing that via an API. So if you're trying to build a network application, you know, it started out just just segregating VMs and applying service or instances and applying services instances. Uh, and, and now you, you, t you talk about you know network slicing, right? How do you implement the network slice? It's something you know. A lot of it's taking what's it at what's at Amazon and bringing it down into a functional clone of Amazon. People won't tell you that. OpenStack is an on-premise clone of Amazon. Look at all the features that come in. Um, a lot of these are implemented through the network layer and, and can be efficiently implemented using over OpenFlow, right? I, what I'm saying is, shouldn't we 
help accelerate OpenStack and implementation of OpenStack into both virtual and physical gear to make automation or provisioning of networks on a part-time basis, for service basis. Yeah, uh, uh, please contribute developers. I love the developers that you guys are contributing. Yes. 30, 30 Continue. Good, Thank you. Thank people working on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, 300 people, uh, there's been 300, uh, 770 people, uh, developer, active developers on it right now from 550, 550, four months ago. Cisco is doing great contributions inside of there. But how it's done, frankly, is immaterial. At the, at the, at the switching layer, whether you implement via the, the, uh, the quantum plugins to UCS and Nexus, or if you're using, using an OVS, frankly, it doesn't matter. What matters is your ability to insert services and emulate em, emulate the functionality in the largest cloud provider in the world. So, uh, do we think that clouds should go OpenStack so that we don't have the right to Amazon APIs and Rackspace APIs and GoGrid APIs and Azure APIs? Well, and a couple of things are, are emerging. So, one, absolutely, I believe that you should, that people should be looking at providing services to developers similar that that Amazon provides. In because the reality is, is software development is moving into that, uh, in, in, into consuming these network-based applications and services, whether it be a database as a service, load balancing as a service, firewall, whatever. These things are provided by, by, by Amazon. OpenStack absolutely is an emerging alternative to that. I think the Grizzly release is a strong beta. Havana in the, in the fall will be a strong, a strong, strong um, 1.0 release. You know, I don't, don't discount and think it's easy for anyone to plug in. Um, but is it valid? Absolutely. To me, that is a very exciting you know, development and opportunity to really help customers well, it, reduce their operational cost and make, make things very you know, agile. Eh, well, I mean, right now it's just providing services to developers. Now, it just tie it back into the, the discussion for OpenFlow and Cisco, whatever services. If you look at people that are actually implementing, um, they're writing plugins, not doing everything in software. I mean, look at, look at Gap. For example, you know they they, moved, they they deployed OpenStack. They didn't write all their storage software on their own. They didn't write all their load balancing software on their own. Uh, if memory serves me right, they used um, uh, they they wrote hooks into Cinder from their EMC storage, and their load balancing as a service. Uh, I think F5, uh, but they used the code that Cisco sponsored Marantis to write. Right, mm -hmm. so they're using hardware for their content for their for their, for their content switching. I don't know if they're writing platforms, but. Well, as people are scaling, you know, especially enterprises, they have all this expensive blinky stuff that works for them quite well. And I think someone made the point of dual purposing, right? So I have an existing network and then I have these existive innovative features I'm using. And there absolutely is a reason. I think that was one of Brent's requests. Give me something that supports, right? Because I want to have my, my old environment, my current enterprise virtualization, you know, thing, the Web 2.0 kind of stuff or DC 3.0. And then this new emerging platforms, whether it's an open stack based cloud or whether it's a segment of my application which uses OpenFlow to apply and control services through here. I mean. Yeah, and I think, so if you look at kind of the strategy that we have laid out, you know, we made sure that there's no technology religion, right? That, you know, whether it's OpenFlow or whether it's one I could have heard, I swear, heard you say open, open, uh, OpenFlow is the devil. <laughs> where, 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 no, 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 no. I, I think the argument, argument is OpenFlow only switch versus a switch with OpenFlow and other things. I think that's where the argument is. Okay. Nobody's saying, you know, OpenFlow is bad. Right? Nobody's saying that. I'm not saying that. I think I heard it was from you. I thought I heard no. it's insecure, it's untested. No, I said it's, it's not yet at the maturity level. It will go through the maturation cycle, fantasy. right? And we will ring things it's up. Fantasy. We can go through Twitter streams. <laughs> but, but, but we'll adopt if it becomes. But you know, we are supporting OpenFlow, right? Yeah. And lots of switches, router. Well, so, well, I think so, you've taken the argument away. I mean, it sucks to have arguments over religious wars. Go write some code, right? Um, <laughs> but I mean, there's a demonstration today of actual SDN con uh, controlling, uh, applying security policy. Right uh, of taking taking one PK and popping it through this the, this was CSC, right or the, through the cloud controller, right. Um, I, I think stuff like that's where the focus should be. You know, stop arguing about whether it's valid and yeah, write so, code. And again, the argument is so Cisco support you know platforms that have valid. one PK that have open flow. Customer mm -hmm. can choose to turn on whatever they they need to based on the risk profile that they're willing to take. Um, what we are saying is that. We are not yet ready to say we will only have an open flow only switch. I think that's, I, I, I that's think the only, only difference from, uh, from what Greg, Greg said earlier. I, I would say that it, it, it is probably 
not realist. I mean, I, I, I believe that uh, there will be other services and other features needed on, on any box, even box. Um, you know, I think pure open flow based is still, I mean, even if you look at some of the pure, like PKA, for example, there's still some things that you need to do outside of the open flow protocol period, right? Because the protocol just says, receive a packet in, send it to a controller, but there's some other stuff you need to do. And I think the ASICs are very smart, actually. But actually, ASICs. the PICA 8 will have some use cases, I think. Yeah, you are talking about use cases. There, I mean, there are use cases for Dell. There are use cases for NetGear. So we're always going to have There are the use cases for PICA the 8. There's no issue. But right? I, I think you point out, I think you're absolutely right, because that, that room for differentiation is on the other plane. It's on the management plane. It's how you operate. The, the ASICs are, are actually much more so capable, right? If you look at the ASICs, they have a lot of features in built in it. Um, so, you know, I think at least the ones that are shipping that are being, maybe it's not customized for open flow only maybe, but, but I think if you look at maybe the chip vendors, I'm not sure they'll ever do that, like only one purpose stuff. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity to leverage the other features um, to, to address a broader market. So, <laughs> Greg, I think you, you wanted to start small, which is perfectly fine, I think. But, I, you know, we were just, uh, I just came from customer meeting, like, you know, I want to, you know, don't give me a data center solution, don't give me a campus solution, don't give me a brand solution. I want to have a solution that actually is. Yeah. is, is and bring all the unicorns and let them ride around the roof at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it is not my, my statement. Yeah. Right? <coughs> but, but there's an expectation, at least from, you know, the being, uh, uh, you know, have tons of customers. Yeah, are different I mean, I, I know that you, look, <coughs> customers are stupid. Right. And they can certainly do stupid things. Wow. wow. I mean, no, you just, I, you just dropped your builder, right? That's <laughs> 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 the quote of the day. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And I mean, I, I, 10 years Break ago, far. I just sat down and I said, just you know, I expect the switch to be able to take packets, paint them gold, and send them on. Right? But that's not, I, mean, I mean, that's what you're sort of saying, wow. is people yeah. actually really want to have a hundred But this is a... I mean, this is purely a byproduct of all the hype around all this stuff, right? Yeah. And conversations of this as, as passionate, they are actually help get some realistic expectations. Yeah. The, at least now, you know, folks, whether you agree with, you know, the viewpoints or not, at least you start to understand what the viewpoints and what the perspectives are. I, I think, to some degree, customers will not be informed. I'm going to put it a slightly different way. <laughs> <laughs> will not be informed until they get the opportunity to download code, code roll up their sleeves, play with it, really understand, okay, this is what it does, this is really what it doesn't do, and just as importantly, do I really want to do this? If I have, you know, a, a IT staff with 50 FTEs, do I really want to peel off five and go write packet classifiers? And for some, absolutely, yeah, it's the way I want to go because I see the payoff. Others are going to say, no way in hell, I'm going to make it someone else's problem. You know, Cisco can deal with it, I'll go buy an application that'll run on a controller that'll do it, and then when it breaks at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's... But, but to pop it back, do you have someone who maybe wants to implement an, implement an next scaler, say Content Switch, who Cisco's partnering with, and instead of, impl instead of putting uh, loopbacks on all their servers to so do direct server return, yeah. do you want to be able to utilize a software feature in already a trusted Content Switching platform to be able to in implement the in effect direct service return without having to hack your, yeah. put in some hacks on your servers? And I think the answer to that is yes. Now, whether that's OpenFlow or 1PK, I don't care as long as I can buy the feature. I think you know. that this whole software-defined networking conversation, at least in my mind, has brought in two, uh, two capabilities you know, in the limelight. One is that we need to have a way to address you know, at a flow level, at that granularity. You may not address all the flows. OpenFlow says I will address all the flows. In uh, other cases, you may not address all the flows. But you do want that granularity. And how you do that, whether you use OpenFlow or 1PK or any other vendor's API, doesn't matter, but you need flow level awareness, visibility, control. Even if it's on an exception basis, I think that's important. I think that is a huge kind of a, a step up from where we were. And the second thing is that you know we have an external entity that is able to interact with the network, right? Whether it's the sole controller or whether it's a hybrid controller, external plus internal. But at least I have something external so that if I need to do route health injection, or if I need to do a special way to forward it, forward it, I have that capability. I don't have to go rip and replace, I don't have to wait for another ASIC, all of that I don't have to do. And I think that's a net benefit. I think we, we often get wrapped around into whether or not this widget is the best way to do that. You know, it may be, may not be, doesn't matter. There are many widgets and different customers, whether they're stupid or informed or pragmatic, they will choose, make their decision. 
But I think these are the two net new things that uh, the whole SBN conversation has, has, has brought to life. Does that, does that make sense? No. No. <laughs> well, I think that's a good way to end it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I'll just respond very quickly to that. If you say to customers, it's like talk, sometimes talking to customers, like I've been a reseller, I've been an IT manager, I've been a, a consultant, I've been a friend, you know, lots of things, right? And I can remember a time where I was like a 10 year old kid. And if you came to me and said, do you want this chocolate or do you want this candy bar? The answer is I want both, right? I want all of them. In fact, give me the whole box, right, that you've got stacked behind the back there. So I do wonder sometimes when vendors go and talk to customers and they say, what is it that you want? They want the whole box of candies. Right? But they don't actually understand what they're asking for or why they're asking for them because they actually don't know enough to understand the cost or the impact of saying, I want the whole box of candies. So if you want a router that does all of those things, you end up with a Catalyst 6500 and the architecture is so brittle that it can't do all the things. You get service modules, you get NAMs, you get supervisor okay. engines and, and the system becomes brittle yeah, and susceptible yeah, I think, to that. I think, uh, so I'm not, I don't... I think we need to do more to educate customers and to give them wisdom. We've spent the last decade taking wisdom away from, from, from networking engineers and teaching them that you know, it's all about packets. It's never been about packets, it's been about flows always. But we always rooted packets, we never forwarded flows. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a large <coughs> paradigm shift that needs to go on. But we need to stop thinking about rooting, we need to stop thinking about switching. So I completely agree with you. I mean, I think an informed customer serves everybody, including the customer. This is why we do stuff like this, right? Yeah. It's not, sure. I mean, it's kind of messy, but I think I, and, uh, people, for some me, not <laughs> I certainly have more faith in customers yeah. and their ability to make informed decisions than, than others, right? I mean, like, they make informed decisions. They don't have an option to buy a candy box at, you know, at no cost because 10 year old kid is not paying for that candy box. He wants the candy box all mm -hmm. lock, stock and barrel. Now, when you say that, buddy, you only have a dollar, this candy box costs $20, mm -hmm. now you make your choices. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to start to make an informed choice, you know, with the visibility and the experience that he has or she has. And that's when rubber meets the road, right? Mm -hmm. That's what customers do all day long. They make informed choices based on the budget they have, based on the operational complexity they need to worry about, based on the restructuring in their organization that takes place. And plus, they need to make sure that the network continues to work. No, that's not my experience <coughs> in the real world. I don't know what customers yours will do, but my experience is vastly different. Like, you know, I'm told that I have to buy Cisco, I don't get a choice. So now the question is, what, to, what do I have to put up with? I, think I can only choose from a given menu that you produce, and that's all I can get because there's so little awareness amongst the organisation. And in fact, nobody really wants the network to add value. They really just want it to be... Um, the server guys want to do everything in service. The storage guys want to do all the storage stuff in storage. They don't want to use fiber channel in the network. They don't want to do fiber channel over ethernet because that's not what, you know, and the application guys don't care about application load balancers because they just use HA proxy or Nginx. Right? Sorry, and and that's fine. That, all, all I'm saying is customers have choices. You know, whether their CIO says, go buy from Cisco, mm. or say, hey, go and buy best of breed components at the lowest price, mm. right? And they have a choice to go to Netgear or to Dell, or to HP, or to Juniper, or to Arista, or to Cisco. And they will make the choices. If they will make the same choices with OpenFlow, non-OpenFlow, right? Or hybrid, OpenFlow Plus. I, 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 That's a spectrum of customers we deal with every day. I, I, I think, Greg, uh, I mean, uh, I think there are definitely a different set of customers who definitely have different choices and requirements. I think, um, and obviously there's lots of, you know, CCIEs, lots of, um, you know, people buying, you know, networking. Networking is not a new industry, right? It's not like somebody came up and say, OpenFlow solves the world hunger and then so I'm going to buy it, right? This is the industry for 25 years and people have created different needs and wants over time. Mm -hmm. I don't think your sort of view of, you know, give me basics and that works. Obviously, there's other ways we would have never evolved from, yeah, but the you know, basics the basic where we're at with the next generation of networking, right? I keep coming back to where in the late 90s we had SNMP and we had CMIP, right? And CMIP was this all-encompassing, all-embracing, amazing standard with X500 integration and it was going to be fantastic. <laughs> and it looks exactly like 1PK. And then there was SNMP. And it was simple, it was cut down, it was easy to use, we could write Perl scripts against it and it would work. 
And what are we using 20 years later? And we had the same thing with OSPF and OSIS and BGP, right? Mm -hmm. It took 20 years for the complex protocols to develop. I think we need to strip networking back to basics, innovate around that, and then find the complexities mm -hmm. that we need to innovate up. Instead of trying to come from the top down, start from the bottom up, right. is where I'm sort of coming to. Okay. And, and you know, without those sorts of building blocks, we, we don't even know what we want. Because I think the new paradigm of flow networking as opposed to packet networking changes the fundamentals. Sure, but you got, you got both, right? I mean, you can just use one open flow and never go near a 1PK API. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you want to do. Yeah, you have yeah. choices. So. I mean, I think that's our but only... I, I think the argument is don't provide choices. Go to the simplest different contract. I'm sure that's a different Is that Cisco's official position? You get the note and you'll like it. Don't provide choice. I gotta put my bash on the As long as you choose Cisco, there is plenty of choice. So I want to I want to change the conversation. amazing browsing discussion, but we do have to wrap up. I want to go. Thank you. I have you know, one discussion, additional discussion. Hypervisors. Well, that'll be a short discussion. <laughs> <laughs> when can we have interoperability across hypervisors? Well, wait, what, what interoperability? What level? I want to move a virtual machine from one hypervisor to another. Just go I want to use the API, same way. Turn on a machine, turn on a machine across hypervisors. I think, I think you should go ask VMware that because VMware According to what they said at VMworld, and has a plan for that this coming year. Well, no, those partner exchange. No, why? Why can't we have a a a, a, a standard body I that standardizes say, I hypervisors? I mean, why can't we do that? Well, one, the hypervisor is not differentiated more. Two, that multi-hypervisor support of libvirt and other common libraries to configure and manage them it is a challenge. But, but if you look at you know, there's Citrix Zen, right? There's Microsoft Hyper V, which is based off the reference implementation of Zen, which means they copied it, right? So you got Zen and Zen. You have KVM, which is widely used and used in most of the large, most of the, hold on. And then you have, you, you have VMware ESX, which ESXi, which is an amazing hypervisor, although not as differentiated as it used to be. Um, but the, when I've talked to the product managers at, at, at VMware, of like, when are you gonna support open libraries like libvirt for management of that platform? Never. Um, you know, the reality is, is in the enterprise virtualization space, VMware is dominant, they make a damn good product, and they, it is against their best interest to interoperate. And then in the open cloud space, KVM's dominant, right? So I get. So I assume you. I mean, I think you're baiting a little bit because what you're saying is obviously they're right. So we get that from abstraction, right? But there are. You're at the wrong layer, right? You're talking about at the best, at most, you're talking about a controller. I think there can be lots of different controllers, but there needs to be instruction sets for hypervisors to talk to, to no, bare metal, I, right? My point is different. My point is in the network. We have always tried for interoperability and multi vendorness Always. IETF, whether there are 6,000 people. We're talking about hardware product. differentiation. When In hypervisors, hypervisors or it's a completely proprietary stack. And yet, you know, we are okay to say, hey, you know, one vendor has 80% market share, and that's great, that's okay. And it's okay to have a proprietary stack, can I install, but not in the network. Can I install a hypervisor on anybody's x86 hardware right now? Pick any of those hypervisors? <laughs> Can I? No, I'm saying hypervisor no. as an entity. So, so today, this when, I put, when I put a VM on a hypervisor, I cannot be motion that hi, that yeah. VM from one hypervisor to another. Why not? Because it's not necessary in the new applications that are being right. written. Not needed. So it's absolutely not necessary. Can give me a common network stack between Hyper-V, KVM, and VMware. But I really don't care because I can get a controller that can coordinate the networking between all of them. So I can have a controller up here that talks to Microsoft's virtual switch or OpenV switch or VDS and it works for me. Well, and so I don't need... I mean, it's not well, and so for enterprise, workload, or for enterprise virtualization workloads, there's a reason to stay inside the same platform. But all these net new applications being created right now, effectively out of cloud, cloud kernel, you don't migrate workloads, you spawn new workloads, you migrate your data. So I'm gonna instantiate 100, 100 instances over here, allow them to, to and, and move my workload into it. The new, new, new cloud design patterns do not need to migrate a workload itself. Copying data 
It's probably the closest thing to it. So is there a need to develop software to handle something for legacy workloads? No. There's software written to handle these legacy workloads to so interconnect clouds running the same hypervisor. You don't need to reinvent the wheel 30 times. That's right. We don't need end-to-end -end networking strategies. Well, well, no, but so like no, my, my, CSR, my, OTV, all right, they're all valid technology for enterprise workloads that will continue to be necessary for very long in the future, and it's good to continue development in that. But when it comes to investments and in features, investment in software, in software development, well, apply more than necessary. I really have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I will stand in the middle of the room. I was just getting warmed up. <laughs> That's why. This, this, is, this has been a fabulous discussion, really. We, we've gotten comments online uh, from people watching saying not, these people can argue, but saying instead, wow, I'm so glad to be watching this and listening to this and hearing this discussion. So that is, that is wonderful. Thank you guys for for doing this, and thank you for giving us the time to do this.